<gasps> Welcome to the Mortal Realms, an Age of Sigmar story phase. Grab your har hammer so we can clear a path through the chaos and forge our own narratives in the Age of Sigmar. Your allies through the Realm Gate this episode are... I'm Davey, and every soul aboard this podcast knows that their profits would sink like a harpoon too vast without me leading them. <laughs> Uh, and I'm Aaron, uh, and move over, PJ, because there's a new shard in town, and this one's silver. <laughs> well, I'm Paul, and uh, sorry if I'm a little hoarse, but we've been talking a lot about silver shard lately. Oh, that's true. Mm. It's a good one. Uh, in this episode, we are discussing Callus and Toll, the Silver Shard by Nick Horth. In the sequel to The City of Secrets, the dynamic duo returned to tie up loose ends on the hunt after an evil that got away and this time it's personal gentlemen how are you doing great doing very good and yourself oh, i'm hanging in there thanks for asking i appreciate yeah. that uh yeah we're talking about uh solar shard in a little bit but i think let's just catch up it's been a while uh what's new what's going on with you folks uh, any major uh narrative event narrative events that have occurred recently uh, I, yeah. I participated in one does that count uh, it a hundred percent counts. Um, it, I mean, I think folks might know what we're talking about and we don't want to steal Eric's thunder, but there was uh, a little, a little get together, a little, uh, shindig called all hello siege that we all sort of, I don't know, hung out at, spent some time at Paul. Yeah, into wearing costumes too. Yeah. <laughs> what a, what a delight. <laughs> uh, and I'm pretty sure at one point Eric does want to do a little, uh, like a show and, and talk about it in depth. So we don't need to get into it as it, very deeply here, but, uh, it was fun. It was great. I, I hope you guys agree. Yeah. Um, I, uh, that was my first time meeting most of the Milwaukee crew. And again, we'll talk more about it there, but I was very impressed with, uh, with that whole posse there. Um, particularly the, uh, the fellows that helped run it. Um, I thought they, brought a great amount of skill expertise and uh awesome attitude to the day so it was very cool to see that are you talking about yourself no the milwaukee people <laughs> but I mean, like so, are you looking for me to talk about you like well it's a softball pitch if you missed it it's not on me it's on you. <laughs> Fair enough. you had the best costume of anybody there it yeah. was actually really good Far and, and i felt really bad for you <laughs> Uh, Paul, Paul, give me give me a highlight. What, what was one thing that really that you really enjoyed about it? Uh, I really enjoyed that I got my army to a, a good like kind of minimum standard. I painted two thousand points in about a week, so that was good. Um, I like like all everything aside. I really enjoyed the fact of playing three games of AOS two point uh, and in particular, I enjoyed when. Uh, Brendan Melnick came over and taught me how to play my army because <laughs> I had not played that army before and I had not played a game of 2.0 until Al Hollow Siege. And so it was awesome to be able to play three games with a bunch of players who just wanted to have fun and I could not have to worry about making sure every rule was perfect and even get taught how to play in the middle of the game. That was pretty awesome. No, no, yeah, and it was a, an informal enough setting that it sort of accommodated um, that that learning. Uh, I was gonna say my favorite part was Davy's awesome costume, but we already talked about it. So my second favorite part was Siege of the Day. Mm, yeah, I don't know if you get Siege of the Day. Did you yeah. hear me? Siege yeah. the Day. Yeah, Siege the Day. Eric uh, does it better. I don't know. I, I, I feel uh, like I got a kid sleeping. I can't yell it. I'm two kids <laughs> sleeping. <gasps> There's another one up there. What? Uh, what did yeah. that happen? It's <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. that kind of podcast uh, uh so my third favorite thing was aaron painted all day long yeah i did more painting that day than i've probably done i don't know three four years prior <laughs> it was Check. awesome and we can cross that off that was my my new year's resolution earlier this year we're good i'm all set all right yeah yeah uh so that was that was a fun little event a couple weeks ago um you guys up to anything else cool that the that the listeners are going to want to hear about well, I registered for Wapaka. Mm, cool. That's coming and, up. And I registered to run another narrative event at Adepticon. Wow. Oh, I didn't. Punishment. All right, go for I was it. Say, I didn't, I didn't, you didn't tell us about that. No, I, I, I just finally knew it got on the schedule like two days ago. So <laughs> uh, I, uh, I had to make sure that everything would work out and I would have enough help and that kind of stuff. So sure, sure. Any, all any, pieces uh, coming. Initial whispers that people could find out about? get get excited for maybe sign up for um well it's going to be the same basic terrain i'm hoping to make improvements to it 
uh, but it also is going to be a completely unique event. Um, and I will say, um, without providing any spoilers, um, this book itself was a whole ton of inspiration oh. uh, for cool. the narrative itself. All right, all right. So uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and yeah, That's Jamie, fun. was there was there any gibbering in this book? Hmm. Was it? Was it I in? don't know if that word was actually written. I think you could have uh, read between the lines and assumed that something was happening. Sure. Mm -hmm. like you know, one specific character yeah. where, you know, yeah, stuff I was wriggling like around. Good gibbering is always between the lines, in fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's true. Hey, guys, uh, I feel like we're, we're inching towards it. Maybe we just maybe we just head to the maybe we head to the book review part of the, the, the story st phase episode. Yes. The story phase. Let's do this thing. All right. In the story uh, phase, we delve into the stories, characters, creatures, and environments of the Nine Realms. A malevolent threat looms over the once great city of Excelsis. For as long as the treacherous Ortum Vermeer lives, civilization is no longer safe within the realm of beasts. Witch hunter Hanover Toll must brave the deadly seas and jungles of the Talon Coast to stop Vermeer before he can reach the legendary lost city of Zoantica. For within this forgotten ruin lies an artifact of darkest sorcery, that possesses the power to reshape reality itself, the Silver Shard. Ken Toll and his companion, a former Free Guild soldier known as Armand Callus, capture their nemesis in time? Or will Vermeer evade the Order of Azir's justice and tear the mortal realms asunder? I always pictured you uh, more of a gold shard, PJ. <laughs> That's fair. You're, like, you, I mean, you yeah. won the gold of, of my heart. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Hey guys, so we're we're talking about uh Callus and Toll, the Silver Shard, and this is the spoiler free section. So if you haven't read it, hang out with us, join us, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Um as always, we're gonna we're gonna stick to the facts. We're gonna stick mm -hmm. to the, the 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 details that are worth sharing. Um and I think oftentimes we start with the when. So when are we dealing with? Uh, when does the story take place? Well, it takes place after City of Secrets. At the very which, least. Yeah, which if you're interested in these characters at all, I would highly recommend reading first. Um, there's also a couple short stories uh, that were in Malign Portance, I think, that also involve Callus and Toll as well. Um, so in within the Black Library, we have a timeline for these specific characters, um, which is kind of a cool thing. We haven't had that as much outside of Stormcast before. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty cool idea. Sure. Is it were there were there malign portent stories? Because there was the one story that was the the old ways that came out. I think like an advent story, maybe. Um, were they also an MP two? Um, I don't know about that. I, but I, you're right about the uh, the old ways. I, and that was as I was reading, I was vaguely I was like trying to remember. I feel like I feel like there was more than City of Secrets, and it was all kind of blurring together. But yeah, so they had they had another little bit right yeah agreed. i don't think um i don't think you need to read old ways i don't know that that um ties into this at all. i mean maybe just i mean it fleshes out the characters to some degree um and but i don't think anything that happened always not that you shouldn't read it uh, i don't know that it informed much of this story per se i think it's really yeah. in my experience or the things that i can remember it's mostly just the the city of secrets but if you want to chrono like a release order or the chronological order you might as well, i mean might as well read them mm -hmm. cron out this is not a 40k podcast sorry man Sure, I don't, I don't get that joke, but I like Necron, it. Oh, Necron, oh, oh, Cron, they're, oh. they're, they're robot dudes. Um, <laughs> neat. Uh, so, uh, from what I gathered, or what we, I think maybe we might have even talked about it when we did our city, city of Secrets review, but um, that took place almost a century after the Realm Gate Wars, and so we spent a lot of time talking about those books that were about um, founding, like the free cities of the moral realms, and Excelsis being being. Uh, like a banner example of that. Um, and so this is, I don't know how many years after that or months or what have you like. Yeah. Uh, and interesting trying to specifically place it in time. Um, I don't know that there's any clear indication of whether the necro cake quake has gone off at this point. Doesn't say point. One or the other. Um, yeah. You, I mean, we're dealing with some, some magical stuff, but I don't know that we were so steeped in magic that someone would have been able to make an offhand comment to say like, oh, well, my magic's so much more powerful or what have you, because right. ever since that quake happened, I don't even know that we were put in a position where that would have been brought up. Right. So you can't say one, I personally can't say one way or the other. Yeah. Right. Well, I think there's an argument to be made that it's before, but 
that probably be something to talk about a little bit later. Sure, sure, sure. Um, uh, we may dip into a little bit of spoilers in terms of uh, City of Secrets, um, just because this is the sequel, so it'd be hard not to, and we're sort of setting the stage. Um, if you care about that, maybe tune out. But um, it's as we even mentioned in the little preview that Paul just read, uh, the reason it's important that this is following the City Secrets is that we are the events from that story are directly leading into what we're, we're dealing with here. Um, the 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 villain, I guess, of the previous story, uh, Ortam Ortam Vermeer Vermeer, uh, fancy, cool sounding name, um, is on the run, and so that that's sort of the impetus that sort of drives this this story forward, mm-hmm. which is uh, pretty cool. I like a good chase. I like a good chase story. Well, uh, I don't know if I would say he's on the run. He's searching for something. Yeah, I guess you know it. Yeah, that's a good point. He's not running away from them. Maybe he's running towards something. Yeah. And, and he was running away at the end of City of Secrets. I, I think that's fair to say. But at this mm-hmm. point, he's now searching for something. That's true. That's that's a better way to put it. And I like that uh, clarification. Um, any other thoughts about the when that we're dealing with? But uh, beyond being a sequel to that one book, I don't know that we have any other thoughts on where this is placed in the timeline. No, I, it, it feels like it's uh, some handful of not, you know, not a crazy number of years after that because they they seem not too not too changed in their interactions there hasn't been like a a huge amount of significant events occurring in between so sure um, and maybe this isn't happened to the when as much but um sort of the uh the the back and forth of the relationship that we see or that starts to develop in city secrets is sort of a um protege i just made that word up um relationship between the the witch hunter and his and his his buddy and i still even feel like that's still the relationship now um and so i don't think it has it occurred too much later after that book otherwise that relationship might have evolved past that like stage which i don't think that we've evolved too much past that uh, right was that protege echo yeah, what would the well? We don't I need, like that. I'm gonna look it up later. Um, well, I, I, I like it. I think you did a great job. Well, thank you. You That's invented great. a new word, and I think you're it's, just it's, saying that because you, you won my heart earlier. Um, okay, so <laughs> that, it's the when. Let's talk about the where. Where where are we at? Tell me about it. Uh, so the Talon Coast uh, and the waters around it. I I get the impression that the Talon Coast is maybe a specific part, uh, if I remember right, like to the south of some of the time they spend. But uh, think of the wilds. Um, not immediately outside, but uh, geographically reachable from Excelsis. You know, some of the mm-hmm. uh, everything. Everything feels like m- most of the locales, at least, are within Excelsis' uh, sphere of influence in some way. So, yeah. um, whereas City of Secrets was, as you might imagine, sort of defined as, you know, that it, it took place entirely within the city. This is is uh, uh, outside that city is where almost everything's happening. Yeah, um, and I think that sort of. Um, informs the plot quite a bit. Um, it, it's much more of a, more of an adventure tale than the city of secrets secrets might have been. That was more of sort of an, an urban like intrigue type story. Um, mm-hmm. This is the folks really getting out there and you know seeing the sights, so to speak. Um, and since we're in in Gur, uh, realm of beasts, uh, the the environment is very much an adversary as much as any sort of the characters could possibly be. Um, you're dealing with a lot of the the bestial denizens of of this area. Um, we talk about how like, uh, assuming we're somewhere remotely near the center of the realm, how like the, the magic isn't particularly wild here uh, in that like, it's not out of control, like the magic aspects, but that doesn't mean that the, like the beasts themselves aren't um, a real threat and aren't, you know, sort of omnipresent. And we see a lot of different examples of uh, what, what it means to be in the wild places of a very wild uh, realm. Yeah, I think an interesting thing to think about this novel in specific is that City of Secrets fleshed out Excelsis, and now we're fleshing out from there. So we're expanding upon an already known place with the same characters, um, yeah. which I, I don't know that we've had that before in Black Library. Um, and it's also by the same author uh, as well, which is a fun exploration, I think. Um, which I think is one of the key points of the book is that it is an exploration of the city of beasts. It's a very tight, um, more defined exploration, but I, I think that's a cool idea. And, you know, you kind of touched on something I hadn't thought about before, but the first book is very like localized in the city itself. And then like the short story, the old ways is kind of like a, an outpost of that city. Mm-hmm. 
which is, I mean, it's still out there and it took some traveling, but it's just a little bit farther out. And then this story takes out, takes place like in the wilds further yet. Um, mm -hmm. So there's kind of like an escalation or like a, you know, a, a chain or like an evolution of like the, the sphere of where these, these stories are taking place, which is kind of cool. Whether it was coincidental or intentional, I don't know, but um, mm -hmm. that's kind of cool. Uh, right on. So realm, uh, realm of beast. Grr. Uh, cool place. Grr. Visit sometime. Um, let's talk about let's talk about the who. We thrown some names around. Um, so some of the folks who didn't read the first book may be confused as to who we're talking about. Um, I know it's, I know it's Callus and Toll, but I wrote Hanover Toll first. So let's talk about him first. Uh, who's this? Who's this dude? Witch hunter. Yep, yeah, witch hunter. Um, and then specifically a member of the Order of Azir, uh, which most of what we've learned we've learned through reading about this guy right like uh i think mm -hmm. it maybe has popped up in a couple short stories elsewhere um but uh hammer hall yeah there was the one short story about the married witch hunters that was written uh, by taller karn and s something something they got a novel now too which we need to add to the list but yeah um, these all kind of came out at the same time too that short story I, mm -hmm. City Secrets was, sort of predates all that, but then Hammer Hall came out at the same time, so we were sort of hit with yeah. hit with witch hunters, um, yeah, in like a year period, um, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, but Hanover Toll is definitely the first one that we encountered, uh, the first one that was really fleshed yeah. out, mm -hmm. um, and he seems to define himself almost by his um, difference to the normal witch hunters a little bit. That comes up quite a bit um, of how he's not quite like he's very good at what he does but he's not quite what everybody else would assume him to be. Um, and you know, so I feel like he, tried to, he tries to put on that like impression or that airs, but like, I don't know. I feel like witch hunters are that like, that's, I don't know. I, I, I don't disagree with you. I think maybe I disagree with him a little bit and that like, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, witch hunters do kind of have to you know, m make up their own, their own way and, and solve problems, you know, creatively. So are you a witch hunter? Uh, shh, I, come on, man. Uh, it pays the bills. Uh, Are you a witch, Paul? <laughs> uh, hey, you have to, you have to tell me I'm a witch hunter. Um, <laughs> not uh, even in the same room as you. You don't have that power. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I mean, he's, I mean, he's cool. Like that's, he's, he's supposed to be this sort of cool, competent, like, I mean, he, he, in a different time, in a different place, he could be a, a James Bond. He's got gadgets. He's, you know, he's cool under pressure. He makes contacts. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, is, is, can win people over. There's, spoiler alert, there's no, I mean, no real ladies in his life, but there could be. Not not, not because he doesn't want to. Um, so, like, it's that whole um, effect. And, like, I like him. I, I think it works. Uh, he's, he's convincing uh, at it. And um, it's yeah. a cool dude. Uh, so, in terms of the, the, the story and, and who he is and what he does, um, he, he's picked up this uh, callus, the titular callus, um, he rescued him back in the first book, and they be, they became friends and started working together. Um, he was integral into the defense of the city of, um, of Excelsis when it was, you know, uh, I'll vaguely say under attack in, in the first book. Um, and basically, the main impetus of the plot of this book is he he was betrayed by this uh, Ortem Vermeer, mm -hmm. a pretty good friend of him and a, a pretty good friend of his at the time, um, because he was sort of a staple in the in the city of Excelsis, and because of that mm -hmm. betrayal. He's he's on the hunt. It's yeah. something that's particularly shaken him, right? Because uh, as yeah. as a witch hunter, someone who's looking out for this that uh, he could have overlooked a close friend, um, having having uh, had such a major and catastrophic uh, a, a major betrayal with such catastrophic consequences, uh, mm -hmm. he is wrestling with that for a lot of the book. Yeah, it's not like yeah. he just misread his friend and yeah. like yeah. Oh, I mean it's no big deal. No, oh, it turns out he does like tacos. Oh, <laughs> oh crap. crap. Yeah, I shouldn't. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And I think that's part of it is that um, he was one of the few people that he trusted, right? And this one of the few people that he put all his trust in became the betrayer in the last book. And so I think part of this book is also a search um, by Toll to figure out if he can trust again. Like I think that's a fair thing to say that that's what he's trying to figure out, and he's pursuing Vermeer to I think work out what it is or who he is right like what his purpose is um, so it's an interesting kind of uh, thing because in the previous book Callus was really trying to figure out who he was 
because of his situation in this book, it's flipped the, the script a little bit. And Toll is really trying to figure out who he is. While Callus seems to be pretty um, pretty stable and, and one of the more understanding characters, I think. So. Sure. Let's, let's flip to him then since we're bringing him up. So yeah. there's this uh, Ar- Armand Callus um, mm-hmm. who was a, a free, good, free guild. Was he just like a, a soldier? Was he a... Um, he was a corporal, I think, Connor? when he got... Yep. Uh, well, he was a corporal to start, and then he had just received a promotion at the end of the book, which he then uh, stepped away. But yeah, he's like a... Turn, turn in his um, badge and his gun. Yeah. Um, turn in your badge and your weapon. Crush it. It was his last day, too. Uh, <laughs> but um, so he, he was a, a member of the guild. Um, I mean, not to describe the whole plot of the first book, but basically he, too, was betrayed in some in some capacity. And so uh, he found himself sort of on the outs of this, you know, organization that he sort of knew intimately. Um, Are you saying that Armand Callas is a lethal weapon? Uh, I, I thought it was your words, not his. Yeah, I thought it was, yeah. was unsaid. Um, so he was he was in a way saved by Toll. Um, and mm-hmm. they, they they worked together at, at that book. Um, but so we were talking about betrayal, like uh, in mm-hmm. in a way, uh, Callus was betrayed too, um, by people that he 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 trusted. Um, and you talk about like how the the, the roles were flipped. Yeah, I, I know. I definitely see that in that. Uh, Toll was like a very sure, um, or like very stable, very you know steady character in that first book um where callus is sort of you know um what's the word uh uncertain and and had a lot of had a lot of stuff thrown at him to shake him um where i think by the end of it he sort of he sort of realized the sort of person he was going to be like he he, the arc that he um experienced in that book where he he sort of developed into this full-fledged you know person fighter agent of his ear what what have you and so that sort of carries over into this book and then like you said toll is, is sort of having a crisis of faith um yeah because so i think you know, i think that's an important point is that armand callus is no longer just a free gilder now he is an apprentice right for the order of his ear or he's he's working uh, towards this I don't know what the word is but i think that's right yeah um whereas in the previous book he was just a free gilder that happened to fall into league with toll and was like, I don't even know what's going on. But in this book, he's fully in league with him and like been like, all right, this is, I guess, what I'm going to be doing yeah. going forward. Um, so he has cut all ties with the city of Excelsis, which were kind of tenuous at the end of the last book and is like, nope, this is what I'm doing now. Sure. So that's definitely a character shift for him because before he was literally defending the city and now he's not. He's removed himself from the city and he's going with an individual instead from the order of his ear. Yeah. I mean, defending it in his own way, perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah. Good point. Um, keep uh, what's his face from coming back. So who are they defending Excelsis from? From what's his face? What I, like I just said, no, Orchim like, Vermeer, Orchim Vermeer. Uh, what, so what was he before he, he was a high ranking, like city official or mm-hmm. was it like a religious figure? Like what was his deal again? I, well, I thought he was like the chancellor of the city. Basically Ooh. he was the guy in charge, right? That's a good way to put good way to put it. I anyway, mean, regarding whatever his name was, he had a lot of yeah. um, political influence. Um, mm-hmm. I think that was why uh, Toll sort of um, not just liked him, but like was able to like work out a sort of mutual agreement with him is because he had, information or access or power that like would, would have been useful to toll. But as we know, power corrupts. Absolute also, power corrupts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Abso- you know who else corrupts? My boy Zinch. Uh, also. A boy? Fairly corrupting. Is he a boy? I don't know. Did you what? assume his gender? My bird Zinch. <laughs> is he a bird? I don't Or is that just, well, whatever. Um, but at any rate, uh, <laughs> And the last book, the, the the mask comes off. I don't. He wasn't wearing a mask at the time, but it turns out he was, he was a, a, a ancient follower or magister or what have you. Um, all along, surprise. Uh, and uh, he still is in this book too. That hasn't changed. Um, surprise. So, uh, led an attack on the city. It failed because good guys prevailed as they ought, and uh, he he was sent. He was sent running. Um, now in this book, as well, we. Sort of, well, go ahead. Hit me. Sorry. Right. I, I think it's important to point out that Vermeer failed because he underestimated Toll. Okay. Right. I think it's fair to say that he under, underestimated Toll and his ability to shake off the fact that he was going to be betrayed. Right. I thought, I think that Vermeer in the last book was like, this betrayal is going to destroy everything. 
and no one has a chance. And instead of despairing in the last book, Toll was like, no, this proves my point even more. And like basically went on to overcome the odds in order to make sure that the city of Excelsis was saved. So Toll transferred his allegiance from his friends to his profession. Hmm. Cool. So I buy that. Yeah. I, I think that's just a, a, it's a little important because I think Vermeer here, if you don't understand that Toll outsmarted him, you don't understand why Vermeer is trying to stay ahead of him and trying to not get caught, right? I gotcha. Yeah, I mean, whereas before he wasn't necessarily afraid of him, like before no. the betrayal, whereas now maybe afraid isn't quite the word, but it's, it's close. Um, yeah, right. He realizes he's capable. He respects him, than, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's another way to put it. He realizes he's capable of more than what he initially gave him credit for. That's fair. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so cool, we've cool. got Chev Arkless. Yeah, so this is a new character. Um, uh, I bring her up because uh, she, she isn't necessarily integral to the initial plot, but we sort of pick her up along the way. Um, and by along the way, I mean chapter one. Um, yeah. <laughs> she is an she's elf. Not, elf she's elf. new from City of Secrets. Yeah, exactly. She was not in City of Secrets, but she's a main character in Silver Shard. Correct. So uh, we, we can talk a little bit about her. So she's, she's an elf. <laughs> Um, I don't know what the word is, uh, an explorer, an archaeologist. Uh, I got I got some Indiana Jones vibes from her. Like she, I oh, mean, yeah. she worked in a museum or something at some point. Um, I think she did, yeah. Yeah. And so she Which sort of- named started, after the dog is the real question. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, <laughs> she uh, sort of thrown, thrown into this uh, because of her knowledge of um, ancient artifacts and history and so on and so forth. We, we get into the details of how and why, but um, mm -hmm. this, this character it plays a large, large part in the, this hunt for the silver shard um, mm -hmm. and, and stopping the, the evil powers that are after him. Yeah. So full disclosure, Nick Horth has called this book basically an Indiana Jones adventure set in Warhammer. Oh, I didn't so, know that. I just yeah. that. Cool. So yeah, it, it was in one of the previous Twitch streams. So it's fair to say it's an Indiana Jones type adventure set within uh, an AOS setting. Well, and it, it, he succeeds in that regard. Like that's exactly <laughs> yeah. the that I get. I think Vermeer even says at one point, you see there is nothing you have that I cannot take away, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, I didn't realize that. That's awesome. That's a great callback. Well, no, he, he, he actually he doesn't. He doesn't. <laughs> no, but I mean, he, he, he oh. effectively, there is effectively that scene. Right. Yeah, yeah. we should have left it and made him think that he didn't say it. I, w I would have loved that. Missed opportunity. Um, <laughs> but she's cool. Uh, she's pretty. She's um, smart, capable though. It's not. She's not just very bookish. Bookish. She's very Indiana Jones esque in that she's you know uh, physically capable. I guess you'd say. Um, snakes hates Nazis. No. Yeah, all of the above. Um, so does that make Callus Marcus? Did he get lost in his own museum? Guys, I. I'm sorry. This whole time I've been pretending like. I've actually seen an Indiana Jones. You movie. haven't like, seen Indiana Jones, and I get the gist. Like I know, I know that I, generally I know, like, how it goes, but I don't know that I've ever seen. I don't think I've ever seen one. They're on Prime. I have a six by four foot projector and surround sound. You should come over and watch them. Actually, they're amazing. Me. I watch them in my own basement. Thank you very much. <laughs> as uh, long as you watch them, that's the only point. Yeah, I was just gonna I make you come get around to it. I feel like you're not even qualified to do this review now. I, I mean, know, like that's a I'll big just, deal. I'll just ask you guys questions. Um, <laughs> does she have a whip at one point? No, I don't think she does. Um, <laughs> but she's cool. Chev Arkless. Also, Chev is like short for something longer at some Chevanya. point. But I can't remember. Chevanya. 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 That's even cooler. Um, just as an aside, we don't spend a lot of time about it, but it, it's worth pointing out that Arika Zenth from the first book, Zenth, Zentha or Zenth, um, is from from the first book is also in this one. She comes back. She's she's back in action. Um, that's that uh, dark elf. What would the word be? Scourge privateer. So she's like corsair. A, yeah, a corsair. Yeah, pirate lady. Um, mm -hmm. who who gets told out of a bind in the first book? Um, she's yeah. back. Um, her crew, her sh her ship. Mm, that's we're getting close to spoiler territory. But let's just say that she she uh, also is is aiding the cause and helping uh, hunt down uh, our our antagonist yeah. and the, the the silver shard at the same time. Yeah. Um, but, she's a fleet master. She's awesome. Yeah. I'm, she's one of my favorites. Uh, and who knows, maybe there's something in it for her. It's tough what? to say. 
Um, no. but it's worth her because she's getting her own like novella shortly. So, um, and she was in a short story too. Uh, the wasn't she in the previous one with the eight lamentations preview about the chain? No, that's someone no. else. I know what you're talking about, but no, that's a, a different, uh, oh. like that guy who's like a bodyguard. Um, I was gonna try and pull in that Indiana Jones reference with the whip and then the chain oh. whip. And, yeah, no, oh, no I fail. Um, different, I think probably because it's different. I mean, one, I'm pretty sure it's not her, but furthermore, it's different authors, so chances are even less that it, that it was that it was her in that regard. Um, but she's getting a novella, and if you were planning on reading that, you might as well read these books too to get yourself caught up. Mm-hmm. So that's, but I mean, what else are you doing? <laughs> Check it out. Um, Painting right. models? What? Assembling Ooh, models? Playing Warhammer? I already did that. Is that a thing? I painted those trophies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, so those are a lot of our major major W's. I know we cut the what. Is there any other what's, any other like components to this that we want to talk about before we talk about what we thought about the book and then we'll we'll get into our spoiler section. Well, I, I think it's fair to say it's an adventure cool. story, right? The yeah. what is an, an, it's an adventure story. Mm-hmm. It's not a city intrigue. It's not a war story. It's, you know, it's not an extended battle. It's an adventure. Yeah. And what an adventure it is. What a wild ride. Nah, wild because it's beasts and that's cool. Um, <laughs> let's, talk about, let's talk about what we thought about it without spoiling nothing. Um, what did what did you think, David? What did you think about the book what, initially? Give me some initial thoughts. Uh, enjoyed it. It um, it didn't feel like it cracked any new uh, new territory as far as like didn't really uh, widen my understanding of the world as a whole so it wasn't it wasn't checking that box or scratching that itch um but uh yeah i think if you like city of secrets and you like those characters then uh then moving along if you like city of secrets primarily because of how it uh kind of laid out here's here's uh because at the time it was kind of a revelation of you know since it moved on so far uh uh history wise um that's not necessarily what you're going to get here um but uh, yeah, an, an enjoyable adventure story. If that's a, it, does what it says on the box. So <laughs> mine didn't come in a box. It was a, a digital file. Paul, what did you think about the book? Uh, I enjoyed it. Um, I it wasn't a book that I read from beginning to end, which to me is a, the sign of like an amazing book. When I can't put it down, I'm like, I just have to keep reading. I didn't have a problem pausing at the different chapters. Part of it was, I think the fact that every chapter kind of felt like its own thing. And because it's an adventure story, a lot of the settings moved on rather quickly from one to the next. And so it felt a little bit like a bunch of set pieces that were pieced together. I think that it did successfully, but it didn't make me drive from beginning of the book to the end. Um, But that being said, I love the world building that was done in this book. Um, It's, it was even more world building in my opinion than in Spear of Shadows. Um, I think that was a little bit more character driven and a little bit more exploration. Um, but this one I thought was a really good adventure. I thought it had some awesome settings um, and some great set pieces. Um, but it, it didn't drive me from beginning to end because of the way that it was kind of set up. Sure, sure. So not to uh, say that it was bad, but yeah. Right on. And, and hearing you say that and sort of talking about like the Indiana Jones thing before, it, it didn't really occur to me until now how very, very movie like this book was. Like you, you, you can picture the movie of this yep. book like play out pretty well um, in that there wasn't um, there wasn't a lot of like time to breathe in between different like scenes or not scenes, but like settings or, you know, um, like set pieces, like you said, not to steal your words, but um, it did move from one thing to the next, to the next pretty, pretty quickly, like, mm-hmm. like, a, like an action movie often does. Um it was very cinematic. Like a lot of those places, like I think lends themselves to like great scenes and great action, which you got a lot of, um, but like a lot of action movies, uh, like it, it is in service to that and not necessarily like character progression per se, not that it didn't exist, but it, it by no means was it the main goal of the book. Um, and like Davey said, it doesn't necessarily expand on all that much, um, in terms of what we know about the world. I mean, it, it peppers in a little bit of flavor and new things that we hadn't seen before, but on a, on a smaller scale or like on a, on a local scale, um, which is still cool. Like it's still worth reading and, and, and checking out. Um, but yeah, no, very, very movie-esque, very cinematic, um, mm-hmm. which I didn't really, I didn't really think about until now, but 
yeah, um, you talk about not being able to not being forced or, or driven to uh, read it straight through. Um, mm -hmm. it, it does feel a little episodic as well because you're going from one place to the next place to the next place. So there are very natural like stopping and starting points too. Yeah. Uh, but I don't. I didn't. It didn't take me out of it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I think I read it straight through or something or you know pretty close to it. Um, so it was good. Uh, it was just a fun fun book, just fun to read. Yeah. Uh, the, one of the points that I would make is that it didn't read the same as City of Secrets. Um, so if you read City of Secrets by Nick Horth, this is a, a different style of book. Um, and I think it moved a bit faster than City of Secrets did yeah. as well. Um, and I enjoyed the writing on this one more than I enjoyed the writing on City of Secrets. Not that City of Secrets was bad, but that this was more to my style of reading um, even with it being episodic, uh, I, I enjoyed this one more. Sure. And maybe like he, he grew into the characters or the setting or, I mean, by the setting, I mean like Age of Sigmar setting, um, yeah. with this second or third go around, whatever this is in terms of his number. Um, yeah. I think Dave alluded to it before, but City of Secrets was groundbreaking in that, like we didn't get a lot of, excuse me, um, exposure to like cities and stuff, which is why that mm -hmm. like sort of stands apart. And I think that'll always sort of hold that title. Whereas I don't know that this does anything new. Again, that's what David just said, but anything new that we haven't seen before. Yeah, with Spear of Shadows coming out before this, if this had come out before Spear of Shadows, uh, that would have been a different kind of, like, this is a groundbreaking exploration of the realms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but Spear of Shadows came out first, and that's more of a groundbreaking exploration of the realms. Um, so I, I, I think, I, I don't think you will regret reading the book whatsoever. Uh, I, I think it's a real fun exploration. Um, and it, if you didn't like City of Secrets as much because it spent so much time detailing where you were and exactly what was going on and if this was on this corner of this thing and this is related to the, that's not what this book is about. Yeah. Um, it's, it's more of the, the, the scenes are, and the setting is a little bit more sketched out, which fits very well with the writing style of the book of being an adventure style. So Agreed. I thought that was cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the impression we're getting is it's not necessarily our, our favorite book out of all the Age of Sigmar, but I don't think any of us recommend not reading it. So if, if it interests you, I think we, mm -hmm. we can feel confident in, in recommending it. Yeah. Hey, guys, enough with this beating around the bush stuff. How about we talk about this, some spoilers? Let's talk about the, the nitty-gritty details. Yeah. Do, do, how have we never called it the spoiler phase? I, I don't know. Dare we? Dare we now? We do. The spoiler phase. <laughs> the spoiler phase. Even better. I'm gonna hold on to that. One. <laughs> um, all right. So this is where we're gonna start spoiling stuff. So if you plan on reading it and you don't want to be spoiled, leave kindly. Scott, leave. stop. The Go back. Right there. Read yeah, the book. Sure. Come back. Mark this time right now. It's approximately. Nope. There's no way for me to see. There is no time on this. <laughs> <laughs> 14 hours into the podcast. 14 hours into the podcast. All right. All right there we go. Give me a second. Perfect. Are they gone? Did they leave? Can we talk? I don't know. Go now. If you haven't gone now, go now. What are you still doing here? Yeah. Oh, my God. Get Okay. Hey, guys. Uh, let's start at the beginning because it's a very good place to start. start. at the very beginning. Uh, I'm obsessed with Sound of Music right now. Um, <laughs> so I think I alluded to it before in the beginning, but um, – you crack the book open and you're like, oh man, Callus and Toll, I remember these dudes. I want to get I want to get back into it. I want to see what they're up to. Are they are they best friends? Um Psych. yeah, no. Nope. Not only does the first chapter not start with them, like it, it, you're like four chapters in before you even maybe even more than that before you start talking to them. Um, but instead we're introduced to that Chev uh character that we mentioned before. Uh she and that bad dude, or Ortum Vermeer, are traipsing <laughs> traipsing through the jungle. Just, going by the Golden Lord, but you can't. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. We were just talking about like giving it away. I should have been more. Well, not, and it's I'm not just it. Chev and the Golden Lord. It's also an army of cutthroats. Is it army or just well? I mean, army seems like yeah. a, a big word. War band. A band. I think there was a lot. Like, I, I mean, it wasn't like five. Sure. More than five. I'll give you more than five. Yeah. I'll concede that. Um, there's an interesting grumpy dwarf in this. Uh, beginning chapter as well um and so that's redundant all of them <laughs> uh so shev seems to be a little willing a little unwilling 
uh, going with the Golden Lord. She seems to be in league with the Golden Lord, but not so much in league with these like filthy, traitor, cutthroat, terrible people yeah, that are going Gold- with them. Golden Lord's nice and, I don't know, clean, I guess. And like, everybody's mm-hmm. kind of a jerk. Yeah. yeah. But, like, I mean, this this chapter is basically a setting for killing off all of those jerky characters. Sure, <laughs> like, got there's that. a lot of cutthroats that die left, right, front, center, all around. Because, um, and I had mentioned this before, we're in the wilds, wilds of Gur, and you're finding, uh-huh. finding like, weird, like, paralysis. Like, what, what, what was the, the beast that they were finding? I can't, they had a, a fun name for it that I should have written down, but I didn't. <laughs> The fun named beast that I should have written down. It was not a brachiosaur, but it was something like that. Yeah, yeah, and it it exudes like spores and stuff that like you know drive people crazy or whatever. Um, So this is a fun new beast that we'll never get a model for. Um, (laughs) There's a lot of that in this book. Yeah, 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 true. Though we talk about well, we talk about some of the other beasts every once in a while that I wonder if maybe one day they'll come up. Um, So, but the idea is that they're they're chasing through the jungle. They're they're after this. Mm, it's not just a city or a town, but it's actually this burial place of this famous uh, age of myth explorer extraordinaire that they think, um, well, I guess Shev probably doesn't know why she's looking for it, right? Like she just knows that it's a treasure trove of knowledge that she wants to get her hands on. Well, Shev knows that Ecclesius is a realm walker and she's been studying his writings yeah. for forever and her yeah. father was apparently somewhat involved in this study as well sure, so sure. hers seems to be a very much like altruistic search for knowledge whereas the golden lord is like he has what i need yeah 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 exactly and that's kind of, that's why she's even brought in the first place which jump yeah. ahead a little bit but it's because she has this knowledge about this um say it again what's the dude's name uh Oclasius the realm walker Oclasius the realm walker this this famous explore ex- mm-hmm. who has all sorts of knowledge so that's what they're looking for they're they're after his burial place which mm-hmm. presumably is in a town or a city or, or what have you which is why they're hoofing it through the jungle trying to find this hidden locale yeah. um so just a quick aside we're going to be going through the plot of this book and we're going to be talking about basically what happens but this book i think more than any other book that we have read to this point there is so much scene setting going on that we're like, oh, there is this monster with spores. There's a whole lot more depth to what's going on and where it's going on. And they go to this town and there's a whole lot more depth of how do they get to the town? Like we could go in and talk about every single little plot point of how they get down into the city and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we would be here for hours talking about all the different little details. Um, but that is one of my favorite points of the book is how many little details and how many little challenges to overcome. Sure. There are. I think in, in like adventure movies like this or what have you, there's a lot of hand waving as to how they got here or how they got there. You skip a lot of stuff and this book does some of that and maybe even does a lot of it, but there's still enough of, you know, the, the, the mechanism by which people, people get places when it's interesting that it, that's sort of shared that yeah. um, worthwhile to read. I think that fills out a lot of the book. Um, fast forward, fast forward, you find it. No, um, <laughs> they uh they do so they do end up at the sort of is it it's a crater city right like it's it's down mm-hmm. a, down a cliff though um because they they knew where they were headed and they were able to just you know through the trials and tribulations in the jungle they were able to eventually find this city and it's mm-hmm. in the center of a, a giant crater i don't think it has like volcano implications but just a, a crater in some capacity when you think jungle you think volcano at least to me um and they, they make their way down and they're sneaking into the city because the city is not abandoned, which you would it's think not, it might be. Like it's sort of a well, city. It's abandoned, but it's not uninhabited, I think would be a fair way of putting it. Okay. Cool. Go, go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and so what I mean by that is that this is an ancient, ancient city yeah. of learning. And like, to be honest, when I read this, the first thing I thought was like, this is my setting that I made up this gibbering dome. They walk into this like glorious lost city of past learning, et cetera, like and these marble walls, marble paths, like Nick Hort all of this. Stealing that gibbering dome from Paul. You heard it here. Well, he wrote this before I had my event, but I didn't know about this book when I had the event. And like, so this is the main reason why I really enjoyed this. Is you that think so? like, do you think you wrote whatever? Okay, keep going. 
well, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to claim that Nick Horth was inspired by my event. That is the, hey, the height of hubris. Nick Horth, look me in the eye right here. I am. I am claiming that you stole it. <laughs> uh, uh, so this is the where when we read um, when you and I read the book for the Firestorm campaign, they had this amazing civilization uh, with all these wizards and all this meritocracy that they had going on and this entire history of a civilization, right? This town, to me, felt like it had as much depth and past in history when you walk into it. Um, and I thought that was a really cool thing that I, I, I hadn't seen before. It really gives a, a hint to the age of the realms and of how much history has passed unknown and unseen to us as observers of uh, the, the, the current timeline. Um, I'll agree with that, actually. Um this and a few points later in the book too. Um, I don't know. I, I think the more we read, the more I realize about myself that I'm sort of a, an age of myth junkie. Like I'm all, I'm all about like finding out about like sort of the myths of this already mythological like setting that we're dealing with, not myths, yeah. but like, you know, the, the, the his, history's lost to time. And so the fact that this is sort of an allusion to that um, and um, not allusion, but uh, a reference or a, a, a little bit of taste of what, what that world was. Um, I, I was like, I, for a moment there, I was filled with wonder too, and just sort of see this this setting. Um, then I realized I was reading a made up book, and <laughs> I needed to call. Um, yeah. So, uh, it, like again, this is an awesome description. Highly recommend you read it. Uh, but plot wise, they come to this point where they're like, "This must be the tomb of Ecclesius," and they start searching everywhere, and everybody's ransacking this and ransacking that, and Chev's just like. No, this would not be his grave. This is not enough for him. And so she looks up and she sees this like suspended contraption. And sure. She's like, that's him. That has to be his burial. So she goes up to find his tomb and you know, lo and behold, she's right. Yeah. Well, uh, Nicholas they... Cage shows up with the constitution or no declaration of independence and it's like, no, it's on the back. <laughs> um and lo and behold like the, i don't know at this point like, oh, wait, yeah. wait, have we reduced from indiana jones already to nicholas cage is, is um, that how far this character has fallen reduced um some would say <laughs> uh yeah. do we have a ghost writer in this book is that what's going on oh quite possibly um but is there a rock national the reason treasure. i national the, treasure. the reason i bring him up is because <laughs> of like i don't know the fact that she's in this so they're, they're in the tomb and and everyone's ransacking and she's able to solve this like esoteric puzzle that like actually leads to the tomb but like reading it this is maybe one of my complaints there is no reason for her to think that like or like no real reason to solve any of this puzzles that she came across it just it seemed very convenient that she's like ah i, no, I can yeah. i can do this thing um mm -hmm. which is fine again you've seen plenty of movies where people just magically know the answer to some of this stuff um but it was a very movie setting instead of a very book setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all a national treasure where he's just able to come up with some of that stuff, um, which is fine. I won't hold it against the book, um, but it's fun. So she's actually able to, because of her unique knowledge. So it's good that they brought her along. Um, she's able to uh, find the hidden um, tomb of say it again. Oh, it's Oc Ecclesius. Ecclesius. That's hard to it's hard to get out, um, and she's able to find his, his secret tomb. Um, and it's not just not just a tomb. What what else it's, did she find there, Davy? What did she find? Uh, I actually don't know what we're talking about here. Okay, I gotta be honest. she found uh, a she, piece she of found shard him. glass. Oh, that's right. Okay, it's the, uh, uh, the silver shard. Well, it specifically, was in his eye, right? Like <laughs> she pries it, pries it out of. Uh, like she one one of the eyes on the corpse is a little odd. She's like, huh? Digs that out, and uh, all of a sudden, she's got a voice talking to her. Uh, so like literally stolen from my dark elf character in our skirmish campaign oh my oh, god is it, <laughs> was your character was your character shade glass too because that's what it is right like, yeah it was a shade glass astral compass oh man that's so cool yeah. so what she does is she, she finds this weird eye like david just and plucks it out and like she starts hearing the voice of the dude um ecclesius Himself. Right? I got that right. Yeah. It's because he's he's locked away in the shade glass like eyeball that he's got, which I liked because um I like when they reference the world at large, like when the world like other aspects of the you know the of the the setting of Age of Sigmar. And so this is shade glass all the way from you know shades spire. Mm -hmm. um, 
from Aish. the board game, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this this is a, a now in my mind is now a hallmark of the setting. This is this is a, mm -hmm. a, a, a situation or item or a an event that sort of exists now in the world at large. Um, well, it's an ex, yeah, it's an ex machina construct at this point where it's like this can do these things. Sure, um, I mean, it definitely could be. I mean, yeah, not here because because yeah. actually we have a different. Uh, yeah. Um, MacGuffin to chase, which is yeah. ironic, but um, <laughs> we get the MacGuffin to chase the MacGuffin. Yeah, kind of like the MacGuffin we didn't know we needed to then chase a different MacGuffin. But um, so she puts on this necklace and she hears the voice of Ecclesius, and Ecclesius basically recognizes Vermeer and she, he's like, dude, guy is terrible. And then convinces Chev that she needs to run away. And then we come upon this like superpower of Ecclesius, which is to remember everything and everywhere that he has been, hmm. uh, which is a cool little touch. Yeah, um, it, some of it thought. is that Vermeer like kind of figures out something's up, and he's he's here to get the knowledge from. I, do you think he knew that um, Ecclesius' uh, knowledge was in this? Uh, I don't think stolen. he did. Okay. I don't think he knew that it was in the shades shade glass. I think he knew it was in the grave, or the tomb, right. I should say. Is that, is that what he was looking for, man? I, it's been a little bit that I read it. Um, is yeah. he looking for Ecclesius, like he was actually looking for the, the eye there, or was he looking for something else? Well, well he was looking kinda, for the tomb for sure. He thought he'd get some clue somehow, and I don't mm -hmm. know if he specifically thought that he'd be able to somehow get in contact with the soul or what. But yeah, well, so he. I think he was specifically knew that Ecclesius knew where the silver shard was. Right. So he was saying, if I get there, I will find at least a clue yeah. for yeah. where the silver shard is. Okay. Sure. On the Little, back of the Declaration no. of Independence. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, he, once he figures out that uh, she's got this, uh, got this valuable treasure that may hold the secret he needs, he stops being quite so uh, pleasant and sophisticated. And, uh, comes <laughs> after her so there's a betrayal and she runs for it and uh that's right when everything starts uh going bad anyway or yeah or going awesome because we get our, <laughs> our characters back into it um yeah. so she 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 boogies out she's she's getting attacked i mean uh vermeer eh, golden lord as far as we know uh sends all his <laughs> what's left of his war band after her they're throwing stuff at her and she's ducking dodging javelins and crap and she's able to like get out of the uh, temple or, or tomb. Yeah. Um, As Ecclesius yeah. is yelling directions to her, no, go this way. Take a left here. Take a right there. Yeah, take exactly. a, yeah. And again, you you can you can you you've seen that movie scene, not exactly, but you, like you can picture it in your head. Um, but she's able to escape by the skin of her teeth um, to some to some degree, uh, and she stumbles right into our. I think I said it before. I'll say it again. Our dynamic duo, our our best friend <laughs> club, uh, Callus and or Toll. Nope, just and. There's no or. Uh, they're there, so um, I I already forget why they were able to track them here. Like, how, how did they know to come here? Because here they are. Oh, apparently, no one knows. Apparently, yeah, I don't quite remember. Uh, I, I believe that Callus. I believe that Toll was knew that Vermeer was in the area. Like, I think he had tracked Vermeer to a point. Okay, gotcha. Um, and he knew that he was coming here. And was pursuing him. I think that was part of why this ended up happening. Because otherwise, why would he have hired Zentha and etc. So oh, is, we yeah. also have Zentha here as well. Um, so we have this army of the Golden Lord and these slaves. And we have this force of Callus and Toll with Zentha and her Corsairs. And then we also have, lo and behold, the uninhabited. the Abandoned but not uninhabited city is home to a bunch of what, Davy? Uh, bone splitters. Bone splitters. He asked you because you you have some bone splitters. I did. I do. That's good. He picked up on that. Yeah, I know. I know your brain. Um, yeah. So now we're now we're. I mean, I, I think I think we rushed through it a little bit, but yes, it, I mean, this is a sort of a, a major turning point in the story, and that she she runs into these characters that you know at first that she doesn't know who they are. There's this, some back and forth in terms of who can be trusted and so on and so forth, but they soon realize that she's being chased down by Vermeer and his his goons that um, she's not the enemy, and that um, they need to be facing down. They need to be fighting down the 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 war band that's under the employ of Vermeer, 
plus then uh, the bone splitters roll up too, and it's a three-way free for all. Mm -hmm. Everybody's stabbing and poking each other. Well, and and this is definitely the first example of um, like a set piece battle, right? Yeah. So we've got this larger battle with chasing Shevanya. Shevanya. Then there we have this battle with Hanover Toll and Callus and Zentha trying to rescue her. And then at the same time, there's this ambivalent, but still like, hey, there's a fight here, force of bone splitters that are messing up the works, right? Anyone's and ever this is bone splitters ambivalent. They're like, well, they don't care who wins or who loses. They're just in for a good ruck, right? Yeah. That's the whole idea of bone splitters. Singular, uh, of a singular mind, those dudes. Um, yeah. And, so, and I don't want to overshadow the fact that it's not just that they're trying to save her. In fact, that may be even secondary to what their goals are. Um, uh, it soon becomes clear that their goal is actually to take down Vermeer. Like once Toll realizes that Vermeer is there, that's, I mean, and then we maybe you're jumping ahead a little bit. Like that's now his purpose is to take him out. Um, so they end up, you know, slicing through orcs and, and or orcs and, and other bad dudes alike in his, in his attempt to get at Vermeer, who's who's there, sort of leading his his dudes in the fight, mm -hmm. and so instead of just you know in Indiana Jones fashion, where it was far more of like solving puzzles and dealing with individuals, right? We start happening upon these like battles and trials of strength and trials of ingenuity uh, in a more battle setting, right? And so this is where the AOS really comes to the fore for me is when we start taking like. And this is where I really enjoy the story is we can take something like the bone splitters, right? Which in a previous AOS story, you probably would have had to explain a little bit more of like why they were there, what's going on. But at this point we're like, no, we know what bone splitters are, right? We've had enough fiction. We've had enough background. You can just be like, and there's a force of bone splitters here. And of course they'd be here because they're in the ruins of the same civilization and we know their motivation and we understand what's going on. And so we've almost got a shorthand for, you know, this is fate driving the story forward and almost a guardian defending the city um, from invaders. Yeah, and it's so nice that we're, that was... to, we're able to skip some of that. Like, I, I'm glad that we've mm -hmm. reached that point. Exactly. Uh, and so now Toll wading through baddies, uh, trying to get his, his one shot, his one opportunity to blow uh, and shoot. as an Eminem reference. Um to one shoot. shot yeah to glory shoot. Oh, man now that's a rent reference um <laughs> to, to shoot our, our dude and he, he isn't able to pull it off for some reason i don't know you know it's the classic he's able to get one shot but he, he misses or, or what have you um and orham is able to escape because if he didn't we wouldn't have a story <laughs> and with that our, our heroes have to escape too like they have to escape the clutches of the the orcs who um are not going to be deterred from defeating our dude so uh, basically everybody runs away anybody who can mm -hmm. run away is running away um ortam is escaping with what he knows um and our heroes trying to escape the clutches of of the orcs as well well and i think one of the key points here is that ecclesius is still secret right vermeer knows that ecclesius is with True. shevanya but callus toll and zentha all don't know at this point that there's this other person and this is why everybody was here and this is what's driving the plot forward right like this at this point shavanya is like i can't let anybody know what's going on we need to just i need to escape right and so they all end up running back with toll and callus and shev and zentha to a wolf ship that is piloted by zentha um and so now we're on a ship now we're on a ship. Surprise, we're on a ship. Uh, this is a big ship, too. We're on a boat, man. It's going fast. We're and, on a um, boat. And so, like, not only does she have to keep some secrets from, like, this uh, this party that saved her, but um, now they're a little suspicious of her, too. Like, she was, as far as they know, like, with Vermeer. So, like, I mean, that doesn't paint a pretty picture for her, you know, uh, safety or sanity or what have you. Um, so they have to lo they lock her up because uh, that's what you do on a ship. I've been told. Put it in the brig. In the brig. So instead of a city of secrets, is it a ship of secrets? Uh, no, no secrets. Everybody no. tells what they know. Um, and so uh, they lock her up, and they um are 
I guess they're heading somewhere. How do they know where to go? Um, they are heading because Chev remembered him say, I need to go to the Fate Scar Mountains. So they're heading obliquely to the Fate Scar Mountains. Okay. But of gotcha. course, Zentha is like, oh, by the way, we have to do this thing first, right? They end up on this like kind of side quest. Um, and this side quest is a giant sea creature. Sure. As far as side quests go, pretty cool. Yeah. Exactly. I just watched a perfect storm today. So like imagine a perfect storm, but with like a huge freaking beast <laughs> instead of like just a bunch of swordfish. Right. And you basically got the scene right here. By some huge freaking guy. Um, yeah. That's a boondock scene. Um, um, so... <laughs> just stop. We're talking about when we're, we're, we're doing movies now. Um, so, so, uh, so they're, they're, they're on the ship. Um, they're, I mean, there's some back and forth. I, I talked about earlier how there wasn't a lot of time to breathe in this book. This is maybe one of the few examples where like things die down for a bit. Um, there's a lot of interpersonal like chatting and talking about like motivations and what have you, blah, 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 real boring. I want to see some swords, um, <laughs> or harpoons or what have you as they're shipping wherever they're going. They do see that large beast off in the distance and, uh, Zentha being the, the, perpetual uh, always looking for a buck um realizes that that's not that's something that can be harvested um mm -hmm. and by that something remind me what what are, is it a megalodon what is it gear shark gyre gear shark gyre shark, shark. Yeah. g-y-r-e shark sure um cool i'm gonna write it's, that one down it's a cool awesome thing that's only in the in the realm of beasts gotcha freaking huge it's really freaking huge um but it's something that can be harvested for its you know like it's hide whatever the word is for a shark um yeah and and what have you and so and blubber uh, and organs etc yeah sure basically head to toe they're like an indian uh native american excuse me uh they use every bit of it um yeah and so d through uh objections from basically everybody else on the ship who mm -hmm. isn't a uh, corsair uh she, despite all that she's the captain and she captain and she decides that they're going after it yeah uh, so it's a it's a bit of a moby dick moment where it's like, this is the great white whale, but it's a great black ear shark. Yeah, also, I've never um, met this thing before, but I still want to kill it. Yeah, exactly. It's the biggest one I've ever seen. Um, and so the Corsairs and Zentha all go after it. And this is this bothered me a little bit, is that Toll was the person to kind of like drive the narrative forward in this scene. Where I was like, what about this whole like army of Corsairs that have trained their entire lives to fight this thing? Um, Does but, he beat it? I forget. Is he the one who like destroys it? He he bursts one of the eyes, doesn't he? Isn't he the one who throws the harpoon that bursts the eye? Oh, it's the first mate. Oh, okay. Yep. Who I like he's that. Pretty cool. He's pretty cool. Whose name I forget it begins with like an H or something, but uh, he's pretty effective at, at what he does. Um, but it's a big sea battle. They fight a big shark. Um, they throw everything they've got at it they, in, in ingenious different ways. They, they, they're equipped uh, to tackle such challenges, different weapons and, and machinery. Yeah, and like weapons. barrels of some kind of poison acid thing they can dip their dip their javelins and arbalests spears and uh, mm -hmm. that's pretty it's pretty cool yeah no fighting chance against this thing sure yeah, sure it's a pretty cool naval battle for sure uh, yeah i got a question for you what what uh what color uniforms are these uh these uh, corsairs wearing do you know i uh, don't that's a fun question sure, though. sure seems like there's a lot of red shirts being worn out there <laughs> that's pretty good nice. yeah and i like how we started with a non like a non-specific number of them too so like who knows <laughs> yeah. like right. a lot of them yeah it um, was uh it was weirdly refreshing to me to see uh an author like killing so many elves i'm used to it being like oh and a single <laughs> elf fell to you know 75 humans or something like whoa yeah. um and these were just, they, it made them feel more like denizens of the mortal realms rather than, yeah. you know, like, ooh, super cool, magic y LB guys. So, two well, things. First of all, whose side are you on? Are you on the shark side? I'm on oh. whoever's side the elves are not on, usually, but. You know. <laughs> Fair enough. And second of all, you, you touched on a good point, and I, I won't go too, I don't want to talk about it too much, but like the fact that, like, yeah, elves kind of are like the denizens of the, mor denizens of the mortal realms. As more and more like armies come out, we realize that, like, the armies that we used to know, like what, what were the high elves or what were like the, like, what are they dispossess, dispossess? They end up being just sort of the, the regular schmucks uh, of the world. Uh, and it's like the new armies are sort of above even that. And so 
what we're used to, like elves being like this, you know, the superior beings or what have you, for all intents and purposes at this point, if you're just a Corsair or a, I don't know, whatever other example are that there is out there, but like you're pretty expendable too, um, yep. which is kind of a shame for folks who like are sitting on those armies, like hoping for them to be something like special, like in terms of like owning the models. But what do you mean, like having a whole 2000 point Corsair army? I mean, you have a whole two thousand point like, fill in the blank army, uh, whatever we whatever we happen to bring up. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. That's, that's true. true. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's, I, I really enjoyed as well that like instead of being elves fighting elves and a lot of elves dying, this was elves fighting something else, and it was a pretty like I I really enjoyed the writing and and the, the actual story itself. Uh, it was a pretty epic way for a lot of these elves to die because they are like just you know going crazy going after this whale gear shark thing. Uh, I thought I, I was pretty impressed with the the writing at that point. You two are messed up. Who's like, yeah, man? Like, I want to see that shark kill some people. Like, what? <laughs> well, like, it, and we've talked about before, right? A bunch of the novels where there's no payment for the narrative flow forward, right? Well, like, some, a character you? might die. Means, but... This character might die, right? There are people fly falling left and right. Like, they're dropping like flies yeah, through but... almost the entirety of this book contrary to that these are all like nameless i mean literally i don't know if there's any one of them that gets a name that doesn't the, make it the taskmaster for the golden lord's army did get a name and did get killed well i'm talking about the elves here but, I, I, oh yeah I, I, i'm saying like you talk about paying like it, it's a pretty cheap i i'm not totally discounting it i'm, I'm saying i this doesn't fill the box of like oh there's there was payment going forward it, it's fine uh no problem with it but i don't i don't think it's achieving that goal necessarily Okay. Anyway. If, this, if this were a movie, there would be all sorts of uh, what is it, Wilhelm screams like in this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, left and right. Uh, so suffice it to say that wait, wait, can an elf make a Wilhelm scream? I don't. That seems that. like more of a free people's person thing. Uh, I don't discriminate. Everybody can scream <laughs> Wilhelm or otherwise. Uh, so surprise, surprise! Despite suffering very heavy losses for nameless, faceless nobodies. Um, they were able to take this this um, gear shark down and harvest them up, but the problem is, is we're, we're sort of in rough shape. We're we're worse for wear for the attempt, um, and it turns out that they don't think they can make uh, the Fate Scar Mountains um, in their current situation, and they need to make a stop. They need to make a pit stop and sort of uh, prepare uh, their ship, um, reassess, re uh, calibrate, what have you. And so there is a nearby. Series of islands, maybe an archipelago, perhaps. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think uh, one thing because the the captain was cool. Captain knows the waters, so she's like, okay, you know, we're gonna go to this place. One thing that was a little like record scratchy for me was uh, <laughs> I realized like every place they wanted to go, like that's a half day sail away, that's a day and a half sail away. <laughs> like, man, like huh, this bay is not nearly as big as I thought it was. Like everything, everything was a whole lot closer than I expected it yeah. to be uh a real minor point but yeah so they 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 got to go find somewhere to uh re uh get some emergency repairs so they can make it uh everywhere they need to go well another minor point is that um during the fighting i think chev is allowed to come and help or she's released at some point yeah um and zenfi notices her not hiding the necklace and it's like you better hide that if you want to make sure that everything's going to work out Right, like there is a moment where the character, the the dark elf fleet master, is like, "No, I know what it is that you have, and you better protect that, and you better keep that secret if you want it to work." Um, which was kind of a cool moment to let a secondary character, you know, to have that moment of like knowing what was going on. It uh, to me, it really reinforced her character of like knowing the value of things and understanding her business really well. And I agree with you, actually, and I was going to bring it up, and I had forgotten, so I'm glad you reminded me. Um, it, it It's one of the few times where she goes beyond just being the token, like, like effective pirate captain. Like, mm -hmm. not Jack Sparrow, who wasn't necessarily an effective <laughs> captain. But, um, this is the tale <laughs> of Captain Akazanta. Um, but the, it, it's not just that she know you know she knows the water. She's not, she's not, I'm not going to say she's not one-dimensional, because she might still end up being one-dimensional, but... Uh, this is gives her something else to do beyond that. The fact that she she does have an eye for these sorts of things, um, and her reaction to like discovering the fact that Shiv has this item, uh, sort of 
reveals her character a little bit and that she's not super heartless or not super always driven by making a buck. The fact that she's like, all right, she gives her advice. She um, tells her like, Hey, I know, but like, I'm not going to take it from you or, you know what, that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. gives you a little bit more insight into that. She has a sympathetic side um, beyond just being a, a ruthless daughter of the sea sort of thing. Um, yeah. Uh, there's uh, so after they're like, okay, we decided we're gonna go here, which is this place called Villageport. Um, they happen upon this like, I don't even know, cyclone of the sea. What, what would you call were it? They going to the, were they going to Villageport first, or were they just going to the no, street no. islands just to set up shop for a sec? Had um, to happen to the islands to get themselves seaworthy enough to make it to Villageport. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and dumb move, rookie move. Oh, I'll edit that out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> dropping my bottle opener. Um, no, uh, so they, they have to stop at this uh, series of islands, but it's it, talking about like uh, not uninhabited. Um, turns out there are also uh, dangerous folks who, who inhabit these islands. And we come across a new uh, take on an old favorite, some might say. But rather a seafaring, um, what would we call them? Blood, not just blood reavers, but like followers of corn, like blades mm -hmm. of corn, what have you. Um, which is cool as hell. Like that's awesome. Yeah. That's a good way to yeah. like, I guess, yeah. reinvent something that that folks uh, feel like they probably got a pretty good handle on. Yeah. Um, well, what well, I said about these guys, besides you know, kind of the usual corn stuff, and, and they, it was it was fine. It's written well enough, and uh, but it was very familiar. Some of the like somebody's challenging me i'm the i'm the old captain and i saw off the challenge and you know I'm gonna be these injuries and all that sort of thing. but instead of them being like yeah i mean they were so savage but they were you know they're not very good sailors they were really competent sailors like mm -hmm. uh to once they once they end up because uh, uh zenth and her crew are like ah, i think it's fine i don't think anyone like i know these people are sometimes here i don't think they're here right now uh and then they set off, start sailing again. And like the, the next, you flip over the chapter and the next paragraph is like, and they were there, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tur turns out they were just on the other side of the wall, like having a little brawl with each other. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they see it as, uh, they've got, uh, he, he even does a pretty decent job of motivating these guys. Right. Like, um, they, uh, one of the things I like about how they work with the chaos gods in this is that, uh, the realms are so vast that the, the chaos gods are understood as as by different names and such. They see them as the blood kraken is what they think the, mm -hmm. the eight limbed blood kraken, and uh, they've been remiss in their offerings. So they they have a uh, little sort of arena fight to try and act as an offering, and then they see this ship and like, oh well, this is a gift. Like, let's go get that. You know, we've got we've got something to plunder and, and slaughter. So they, that which is dead and may never die. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so, uh, what I go ahead. Sorry. Oh, so they set out after this um, as uh, kind of a, a joint, like it's a gift to them. Also, you know, corn's gifts are often lethal challenges. So like here, here's a, uh, a very dangerous and difficult battle for you to fight. Um, go to it. You know. uh, I, I really enjoyed this part in particular because this reminded me a lot of the Lustria supplement that we got back in like fifth and sixth edition of Warhammer Fantasy. And there was uh, a Norse or a Skeggy colony that lived in Lustria that was a bunch of marauder reavers. So not blood reavers, uh, but um, Norse uh, marauders that were these vicious pirates that sailed around these jungle waters. So instead of transposing that whole, um, I like that it went more into the AOS vibe and gave them more of a reason to be here. Um, and especially when you go from the jungle with all these vicious beasts, which is also background and rules that were in the Lustrous supplement. It, it tied in really well. And I thought, I thought that it was a nice callback without being a copy of what we had in the old world. And I, I, I really appreciated that setting a lot. That's cool. I'll have to look it up. Um, yeah. So there, 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 there'll be some more callbacks coming up too. So oh, neat. perfect. Let us know. Um, so the, the Reavers are on the hunt they're chasing them down. Um, our, our hero ship is already like on, on its last leg. It's in, it's in rough shape to begin with. And so they're, they're getting chased down pretty effectively or, you know, pretty quickly. Um, the, the reavers are gaining on them. And, uh, Erika, uh, has this 
I guess it's not a scheme because it's sort of thrust upon her. Um, it turns out there's this like a uh, tsunami storm water spout thing going out in the middle of the ocean as, as it does, as yeah. you might expect. Um, and she's going to try and lose the reavers in the storm. Yeah. As um, soon as you see this, you're like, she's going to steer for that. Like, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't realize what I was doing before, but yeah, no, we're talking, talking pirates of the Caribbean. I feel like I've already seen this before. Um, <laughs> in terms of on, they, they roll up to this big giant whirlpool in the center of the storm. There's a big fight that the reavers are able to catch up. They're sending people up onto the ship and they're fighting on the, the ship left and right. And people are trying to board and so on and so forth. And they're, they're doing this all while, on the lip of a giant whirlpool. Um, yeah. Very dramatic. Uh, yeah. I love it. There is, uh, I, again, enjoying kind of the motivation of these reavers. At one point, they like commit to like, uh, they feel like, oh man, because uh, they, they see this whirlpool as like a manifestation of the blood kraken. Like, like, oh, I thought I thought our offering was enough, but clearly, clearly it's not. Here he is, and he's he's totally pissed, and he's you know the blood krakens come for us. And at, uh, eventually at one point they're driving they're They've like nailed the side. Like they've kind of, um, I don't know, not T bone it, like rammed it. Yeah. Right. Uh, and they're trying to drive the, uh, the thrice lucky Zenth ship, trying to drive <laughs> that into the whirlpool, knowing that it's going to pull them in after like, they've given up on like no survival. We're just going to go, we're going to get our kill. And you know, that's, and they're, they're hauling hard on the oars. And I was like, man, how, how wild is it to like, you know, row yourself to your death, like in the middle of the storm. And I don't know. It's, it's not just resigning yourself, but yeah, really yeah. striving for it. Like, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, that's, that's pretty crazy. Like yeah. they still have to be acting in concert. I, I, I enjoyed them as villains. I enjoyed this scene a lot as a fight. Um, might've been my favorite battle in the book. I think I can see that. Yeah, no, it was good. Um, but surprise, surprise, our heroes are able to escape safely. So like, um, what do they do? They they are able to dislodge themselves and they send the the reavers sort of careening to their doom, yeah. and they're able to escape the the storm without. I mean, obviously with some dramatics from our main characters, you know, yeah. being on different ships and swinging from ropes and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, uh, this is this is the only part where I was like, it didn't quite make sense to me because they like had had this huge battle with the gear shark and then they had this huge battle with the reavers. And then they're like, oh, this ship cannot float anymore. It's terrible. We're never going to make it. And then they make it. Well, they were, <laughs> they were like, only a day and a half away. They'd managed to yeah. make some repairs. Like, that was part of that stop on the island, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. Definitely had to well, lift their way in. Well, I think the yeah. ships in the Age of Sigmar are, are maybe sturdier than the ships that we're used to. Because this, this harkens back to a, a little, was it, play garden that we had mm -hmm. this exact same conversation on. Like, <laughs> yeah. We can't possibly make it any farther. Well, but then we do. Like, um, Yeah. But they're able to escape, and uh, they limp their way into the the port of Bilgeport, which is, aka Tortuga. Now we're just that, like, well, see, references. That's here we go. Like you say, aka Tortuga. But this was one of my favorite settings that they had that he had written into the book because this is it's the place incredible. called <laughs> because it's this harbor that's like basically this you know you'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy but for pirates right keep these references coming i know i'm gonna stop <laughs> but it's all within the bones of this giant sea beast like the whole city that's cool is built within this like humongous skeleton and i i thought this was this was probably the most realized setting that he had because we spend a, a decent amount of time here yeah. Uh, but everything is built into the shadow and then some things are actually built into like the rib cage. It talks about how the lookout towers are like built into the rib cage, the rib cage themselves. So like this rib is going to have this lookout tower with all these cannon and like this rib cage, etc. And, and this lookout tower is in the hole of the skeleton at this point. Like it, it was I thought it was a really, really cool setting. Um, and so everything was very much defined within this skeleton of like, this is where the harbor is, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. They, they wondered if maybe it was like a god beast at one point, which mm -hmm. would have been cool. Which, um, yeah, pretty sweet. Which might be the first dead god beast we've ever seen. Uh, yeah, the salamander is dead now too, though, right? That fire dwarf killed? We don't yeah. Even know it. Um, Grimnir. 
yeah, yeah. Fire Dwarf. <laughs> which is great because I'm listening to um, Realm Slayer right now, so I should probably nice. know. Um, man, I'm bad at this. This is not what I should be doing with my time. Uh, <laughs> but so they, they, they limp into the port. Um, there's some... Uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, interaction with the 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 pirate. Oh, yeah. They're trying to yeah. pretend there's somebody else because she's yeah. well known here. She's kind of terrorized these. You know, she she basically is kind of the uh, the protection money person in Excelsis. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if she has an official status as such, but she she basically right. Well, and uh, we talk about how everything's like so close, maybe not so close, but the fact that she knows this area pretty well is like, I mean, it, it plays out that way that like this is her tur like her turf, like this is her area. And like if she was going to well, know. Well, you mean her surf. Uh, her turf. Damn it. <laughs> or is it her surf and turf? What? How dare you? How dare you? Um, <laughs> but yeah, so there's there's that. And you think, oh, maybe things are going to be OK. Um, and like we're going to trust that her her capabilities in this in Arita, this her her capabilities in this arena will, will serve them well. Um, but it turns out that Ortam got here first. Apparently this is on, this is a direct shot to wherever they're both, they're both headed. And he, he rolls up um, with knowing that he's, that they're sort of on their way here too. Uh, and he is able to convince the, the rulers or leaders of this, this area, this port or what have you, the, what are they called? High captains um, to, to work with them and to help them. And so in doing so, he's able to convince them to capture the the, the heroes, the, the good guys, um, the captain and, and everybody else on the ship. Um, yeah, this, this part to me was the only part of the book that felt a little forced. Because hmm. um, Vermeer stops here, even though he has no reason to stop here. And he even talks about it later, how he's like, oh, yeah, I don't even need to stop here because I can have my own transport. But he stops here with the assumption that they're going to stop here. But he has no knowledge of what's happened on their ship. So, like, it, it just felt a little bit forced because it, it felt like Vermeer had knowledge that he wouldn't necessarily have had, which created this, like, kind of set piece showdown. And the yeah. set piece showdown was awesome. But I don't know exactly that I thought that everything kind of made sense in the way that it worked out because I, I, I yeah, don't it was, explain it either. Like I, it was just coincidental or, or convenient at the very least that he was able to um, get here first. Well, I mean, maybe I get here first, but then also like orchestrate this sort of capture of the heroes. But then again, I mean, this happens in, in movies and shows. And I think we sort of just accept it. Um, because it turns out that given that the, the high captains are in pretty strong control of this area, they're able to capture most of the heroes, but not mm -hmm. quite all because sort of concurrently toll has sort of gone off on his own on in, in the port and made contact with uh, a group of uh, Karadran overlords who, um, I mean, if we're talking about like places where deals are done in, you know, uh, commerce is being performed. Uh, you, you can expect K KO to be, yeah, I, mean, I use the term commerce loosely. Uh, you can expect some overlords to, to roll up. And so he's able to reach out to them ahead of time um, and, so, and sort of just uh, make his presence known. Like, what I, don't, I forget what he says, like, initially when he's trying to reach out to him. Like, he's trying to se secure, like, transport to the, to, to the mm -hmm. mountain. Right. Because um, he's Dunsky with Zenthi. Like, the fact that she, yeah. Uh, Free freelanced off to get this shark and put his whole expedition at risk. They they have a lot of tension, so he's he's kind of looking to ditch her as a mode of transportation. Uh, I, I yeah, remember. well, and she also has no ship, right? Because she was well known. She's like, yeah, this ship is done. It like it would take me. She's I think she says a span to repair it, which is like two weeks or something like that. Mm -hmm. And she knows she doesn't have this time. Now, one of the details about Build Four that I really did enjoy is that. There wasn't like one main guy that's like, I'm the guy who's throwing it on the way. There were three different sea captains that were all high captains. And I thought they were number one, well described, number two, different from each other, which I really appreciated. And number three, they all presented their own different kind of threat. And mm -hmm. I thought that that was a cool, because uh, you could have easily just written it to be like, there's one guy and he's super powerful here. And even though you control the seas, he controls build for it and you're totally in trouble now. Sure. Um, sure. I thought that was a really cool um, change of uh, tension, as it were. Well, it's nice to have a variety of um, 
characters, like just to have different perspectives. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's there's an attempt on Toll to sort of capture him at a similar time around that time, but he is able to escape because he's a cool witch hunter and nobody else yeah. is. And but all the captured heroes, the rest of his his party, are are chained up um, and caught by the the high captains, and they are thrown into jail first, but then secondly into an arena fight, which uh, was basically like every other arena fight you've ever seen in a movie. Um, I am Spartacus. And, no, I'm Spartacus. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll skip the the capturing process, and and now we find ourselves in in this giant arena. So it's a um, like a flooded but, um, nautical arena um, where they have to sort of fight for their fight for their lives against um, all sort all manner of like sea creatures or like beasts yeah. of 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 gur. Um, but it, it, it's important to note that even though Toll was looking to separate himself from Zentha, she was captured along with them and put into the arena along with her bosun and a couple other corsairs and. Callus yeah. and Chev. Toll's not in the arena, though, correct? Yeah, but yeah, Toll yeah. himself is not in the arena, correct? Yeah, correct. But I think maybe oh. maybe that's the point he's making is that like he's trying to separate himself from Zentha, but like at the end of the day, like he has either loyalty to to Callus or to the entire yeah. lot, to the entire party. Like, yeah. Um, so they're thrown this, in. Oh, go ahead. This is when Chev was also captured by Vermeer. Yeah. Uh, correct. Yeah. So she's not thrown. So into she's him. not thrown into the pit, and Vermeer has this like real crazy weird crystal arrow head ship of doom um and he's just like great i've taken care of everybody and like flies off with the yeah, whole it's, it's the classic army i'm gonna of, give you i'm gonna give you yeah, these people capture them but save the girl for me sort of thing yeah uh, and so he he grabs her and i i read it as like he hops on like a souped up like disc is inch sort of thing like yeah. i mean like souped up like yeah with his provided by his zangor allies who he almost died, like securing yeah. them, right? Oh, we, I mean, we totally skipped yeah. all over that. Um, somewhere in the book, I don't even remember where. Like on, <laughs> on the way here, um, he stumbles across a bunch of Zangors, and like he's able to uh, not subdue them because it's not a fight per se, but he's able to convince them to to join him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, because another key point is that. Go I mean, ahead. He, he does. He does fight a mutant, right? To there's there's some weird split head Zangor mutant. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Has to overcome. To prove his worth, which he does, and then he uh, he gains their uh, allegiance, basically. Sure. Yeah. Quite the, and this isn't the first time. I had forgotten this until later in the book, but it, this is not the first time he's worked with Zangor. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they definitely came out in force during the Battle for Excelsis. Correct. It was right around there that is when the, like, the Zinch release came out, which is one of the first times that we saw him. Yeah. Uh, another important note to make is that um, when Vermeer captures Shavanya, he takes the necklace from her. And so Shivanya no longer has Ecclesius in her ear. Instead, Ecclesius is in Vermeer's pocket. Yeah. The 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 shades the shade glass eye, I should say. And if, as long as we're talking about stuff like harkening back, it's it's worth mentioning that the, for most of this book, like we get from Shev's perspective, we have a lot of conversations with Ecclesius. Like he, he's very much a character in this story. Um, mm -hmm. because, like, a delightful the, character. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I enjoyed and, him a lot. I know he's great. Um, so we, we, I mean, we talk about Callus, we talk about Toll, we talk about Arika and, and then Shev as well. Um, he's, he's maybe not as much in the forefront. He's not, he's obviously not doing as much, um, but he, he's still uh, a voice that we hear both literally and figuratively. Um, and we, we learn about him as, as the story progresses as well. So let's not, I don't want to forget about that too. I, um, I love his character. It's just like this, like doddering old backseat driver who knows, like he actually knows everything better than you. Yeah. He's a backseat driver. And it's like, stop being an idiot, idiot. Yeah. This is what we're doing here. It's pretty effective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but let's, let's jump back to the arena because everybody's everybody's everybody except for Toll is in there. Um, yeah. And they're fighting for their lives and they're fighting beasts and like, well, they're, yeah, they're fighting they're, eels and then they're fighting this amazing sea spider. Yeah, you see true. the sea spider. That was spider, awesome. Like, like spider and like crab thing too. I think it doesn't have claws or whatever. I mean, just like a, a multi-limbed like sea beast. Well, um, it has eight limbs. It specifically said it had eight limbs. Fair enough. Specifically said it had multiple eyes in the front. That's okay. Um, <laughs> But it, it ends up that like as the arena gets slowly flooded, like our, our our heroes are on the back foot and despite the heroics, they're 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 losing ground. 
um, and you think at the last minute they're gonna they're not gonna make it, uh, but who comes rushing in but Toll on uh, the the Overlord ship? A big um, old ironclad comes floating on in. Is that the yeah. big one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, ironclad that's is the biggest one. one. All right, yeah. so it comes guns a blazing, just doom, 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 doom. There's uh, there's a fun little like a discussion uh, between the uh, dwarven sea like uh, high captain and the admiral. Where the dwarven captain is like, we we had an agreement. You weren't gonna, you know, no violence. And then, of course, the you can't. Uh, <laughs> that was awesome. You can't out legal a a Caradron, uh, overlord admiral. He's like, did you well, see footnote six hundred and twenty nine point four? If you'd yeah. done even a cursory reading, you would have noticed, you know, it's, yeah, this that in the contract is great. Um, um, so they, they said, I go feel ahead. compelled to mention as well. This is easily my favorite representation of the Caradron overlords that we've read period because number one they don't take off their masks uh, oh, number yeah. two like i hate that i mean because it specific says in the background they don't take off their masks and in every other book they've taken off their masks to have conversations and in this one they're not taking off their masks and they're really um they he does the character really well but then they come in with this massive airship and they devastate everything it's not like Oh, I'm just going to be fighting like a normal battle. It's like, no, I am an overwhelming air power that comes <laughs> in and literally destroys everything. And so all this water that's been building up in the arena flows out into the city and destroys everything, um, which leads to the rescue, of course, of Callus and Zentha. Um, and kind of an interesting conversation here between Callus and Toll, where Toll's like, yeah, this was the right thing to do. And Callus is like, you're killing all of these innocent people. And Toll's like, oh, they're not innocent. They live in this city. They have betrayed Sigmar. So it was kind of an interesting uh, back and forth here. Yeah, I was glad that uh, Callus brought it up because when I was reading about um, this this uh, ironclad just unloading on the arena and like the devastation it was caused, I was like, and presumably at Toll's order, you know, just unload on all this. I was like, man, this is this is a little crazy harsh. Like, like the story could have easily changed where, you know, I don't know, could have just as easily been somebody in their similar position. Like what if they had gone to the arena, like, Hey, let's, you know, the, the Corsairs were stopping by and they, they're let's check out, you know what I mean? Like not if it was their buddies in there, but like there, there's all kinds of reasons where you might have people who, you know, might've been guilty of some, but probably didn't deserve to get blown to smithereens slash drown mm -hmm. slash whatever. Uh, I thought it was like, a weirdly like murderous act um yeah and then like uh, they could have just put down ladders and rescued all sure, the people sure. in the arena from the ladders and then flown I mean, off i i see getting the high captains but it, it seemed like there was an awful lot of collateral damage for this uh mm -hmm. and then it made me think you know well maybe toll is not as different from the, the witch, witch hunters, hunters that <laughs> he thinks or as as he's made out to be or or whatever yeah. the case. so uh, but then i was, yeah, I was glad ahead. i would have been pretty annoyed at the the author if that had gone without comment and so i was relieved as it went like okay all right cool like you he didn't just write this and be like yeah this seems fine you know mm. so. yeah but even toll himself feels justified because he's like if this were any other witch hunter they would have destroyed the entire city i'm only yeah. you know destroying part of it yeah. which is an interesting well, rationale well and i said it before that like I'm not convinced, like he says he's different, but I don't know that he is different. And, I, and this is like one of my prime examples, right? Like and even the fact that he's able to justify it as while well, those other guys would have done this is very much a thing that like a shitty, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> you swear, a, a terrible witch hunter would have said, um, or maybe not necessarily, but the end result's the same. Um, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, again, I really like the depiction of the KO in this, uh, in this story and so they basically they pick up the survivors and they head off and they are like hauling as opposed to some of the other books where like they're like it's gonna take seven days for us to cover the same distance that a horse can cover in five they are just like flying along uh to these fate scar mountains um but the first uh person that we have that enters the fate scar mountains is um vermeer with Chev. Uh, and these are some pretty epic, this is another pretty epic setting that we fly into here. Yeah. Um, it, and it's this thing where we've actually seen floating mountains before, right? Like mm -hmm. in the uh, 
Overlords of the Iron Dragon. Yep. And so they I remember out. seeing that. And I was like, ah, well, okay, you know, not as not as new, but I thought this was maybe the best piece of uh, I don't know uh, of descriptive writing he did in the book. Like I was, it, it felt it felt really kind of weird and alien. And I was like, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I did get, uh, creeped out almost by like the, the description. And, uh, I think he conveyed the, the weirdness of arriving, uh, from, from Chev's perspective. Um, I thought he did that pretty well. I, I really enjoyed the setup of this, uh, city that they eventually find. Um, and all the sort of mind bending, they have all the illusions. It felt uh, a lot like, there's the zinch the uh impossible city or something like that there's yeah the i think the inevitable fortress or the impossible city i think are both things that exist but where you're walking and uh after hours you turn around and you're still at the front gate and stuff so yeah um, yeah sounds like a tower yeah yeah right exactly yeah as opposed to uh at the beginning of the book where he had this like lost valley where you have this cliff and you walk down, right? We've got this lost valley, but everything surrounding it is all in the sky. So we've got this hidden, you know, like almost, if you were to take the journey to the center of the earth and put it in the sky, like that's kind of more of the feeling that I got. Um, and is we... there dinosaurs in it? Oh, I don't know. Maybe we'll have to see. Um and so we end up finding another one of these cities that we were in when we found Ecclesius's tomb. Um, but we are in a new city that's called Zoantica. And this is the, the target for all of the searching that Vermeer has done. And in Zoantica is the Silver Shard, or so Vermeer says. And so we have this arrival, um, and Vermeer lands with his entire army and they encounter what of all things Aaron what do they encounter uh a trap where they walk and they don't make any progress no uh they find a bunch of uh seraphon which I knew that that the name of the city was Zoantica like you just look at the word like it's it's talked about earlier in the book it never had occurred to me that like we'd be seeing um lizard men or yeah. seraphon um which I <laughs> like, how, how is that word not immediately make you think seraphon no, i know i don't know how i i was also surprised by it i don't know how that happened uh i think it's because it wasn't supposed to be a lizard man city right like it was supposed to be a seraphon city and so i was like well or but i mean we didn't even know that so yeah it makes no it's i mean as soon as i read it, i'm like man you idiot how'd you yeah, not yeah, yeah. It's, kind of, <laughs> it's got an x in it it's gonna be about or it's gonna yeah. it starts with the next anyways it's gonna be uh, Liz, or seraphon um so yeah so they 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 persevere beyond this it's not a trap but like this this magical barrier or protection of the area and once they reach like the doors of this it's not a tomb but temple maybe you'd, you'd call it uh the the defenders of the temple rise up or appear out of nowhere as are if they the defenders of the like, hidden temple quite possibly um the silver monkeys um <laughs> not following any of this and i don't want to keep <laughs> it's a nickelodeon show <laughs> you don't know it, yeah, it, i said legends of the hidden temple like the, yeah it was great how old are you um kids would run around a little yeah never mind anyway um and so they, this was an awesome, by the seraphon yeah this was an awesome way of describing how the seraphon are battling like it and like so, they're describing the Zangor as basically better fighters, but the the Slan is sending Which, why, forth. By the way, like I I don't necessarily think of them as better fighters, but whatever. Yeah. Well, they were fighting enlightened. There was a lot of enlightened, and there were a lot of um, skyfires. Okay, I guess it was described sure. specifically that they were fighting more of like the. But anyway, so they're fighting the Saurus, and like the Saurus are just mindlessly going forward because that's what they're intending to do and getting slaughtered. And then just reappearing in starlight, like fifteen feet away, and coming right back again, and, and like it was just a really cool way to describe this like inevitable, everlasting force, right? Of like you can beat me, but I'm going to come back immediately, and going to like you know it. It was a really cool way of describing the the way the Seraphon style of battle. Yeah, agreed. It's nice to see it like on the forces of good, like right, like it's we're. I mean they're quote-unquote demons and so it's nice to see that um 
see chaos have to like fight that uphill battle. Yeah. Um, and I think we cut, like we don't, we don't see the results of this. Um, and we, we end up cutting yeah. to the good guys at this point. Well, I well, mean, Ver yeah. Vermeer is like, you guys, you defend this gate. I'm going in this tower. Yeah. With Chev. And so Chev is a cool way of describing what's going on. And then when we get Callus and Toll coming in again, it's this like whole timey wimey thing going on where they think that they're walking for forever and they turn behind them and they think that they've see they've only gone 10 yards. Yeah. And it's this strength of will basically that forces them through. Like Vermeer has no problem doing this because Vermeer knows what's going on. Right. He's like, I'm, I know that this spell is here. I don't care. I'm ignoring it. Right. And Toll as the character who has the strength of will in the following secondary party to be like, nope, this is going on. And I like also here, there's the one line from Zentha where she's like, this is old magic. This is older than us. Like, it was a cool little, like, this isn't something necessarily that would aid her in her fighting and like her ruling over the, the Talon coast, but it was a nice little nod back to her having more of a character than just being this bloodthirsty, slaughtering queen of the high seas yeah yeah exactly um, um so they come upon the the seraphon and they get killed and the story ends right is that what's going on yeah and all done nice next sequel <laughs> so, uh, they're able to uh i guess realize or um do they convince them yeah this, now i'm a little foggy on it because they i mean at first glance they're maybe thrown into the fight too but they're able to avoid tackling the seraphon how, how do they convince them that they're good i forget uh he holds up his uh, uh sigmarite pendant yeah that's what it is exactly <laughs> and they respect it you know what i love like this, this is a classic trope <laughs> and like it's turned on his head because he walks up to them like these creatures he's never before seen he has no idea who they are they just speaks english and he's like dude i need to get past and they don't do anything it's like no no you don't understand we're the good guys they're the bad guys and it's like why do you assume that this race of star-dwelling beings speaks English or whatever realm language that you're speaking right now? And I love I mean, that, like... What else is he supposed to do? Like, invent... I don't know. I just, yeah. like... It's, it, it's an amusing moment to me. He and just he's growl, kind of like, speaks lizard at him. Sticks his, yeah. sticks his tongue out at him. Like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that would be... How would you describe that in the book? And, uh, and, I think I just did. Sticks his tongue out at him. Period. <laughs> Mission successful. Um, so that he's able to, they're able to, uh, w w you know, win the hearts of the Seraphon, uh, convince <laughs> them that they're good guys, and and they they let them pass. And so, uh, I think Callus and Toll both had their head into the tower, leaving uh, Zenth and the KO captain, who has a name, um, back to sort of guard their guard their six. Uh, and they're and they're just down there fighting fighting Zangar, Zangor, yeah. and and they head into the tower. Uh, there's a wonderful little side thing that is not resolved in this story that I would like to know more about, where Zentha and the captain are fighting off these Zangor, and they're like, "Yeah, oh, the Soros have kind of got this handled," and they see this trophy hall off to the right. Yeah. And then they head into the trophy hall, and we don't hear anything more. It's about never that. talked about again. Yeah. It and I'm like, weird. okay. What's going on there? I was wondering if it was like an illusion of like, you know, because this the, the core of this is that there is a being creating all these illusions, which are making it so hard to navigate and continue and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that might. But yeah, who knows? We, is this like yeah. Aladdin and Abu and the monkey of like, I'm going to tend to this treasure and everything's going to fall apart. I mean, yeah. I mean, you say that. I thought for sure by the end of the book, there was going to be the classic, like, their clothes were stuffed full of stuff. And like, <laughs> yeah. like oh, I don't know where that came from. That's crazy. No, that was mine yeah. all along. Um, hey, David, you talked about a, a court this being. Let's, 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 let's get to it. So they, they rush up into the tower and they find, I think, I, I don't know if they find the silver tower or silver shard right away, but what they do find is a, a little skink priest dude who ends up talking to him because he can like speak. I'm going to say common. I don't know what the word is, but in D and D parlance, it's common. They say the common tongue. They might, they might use that term. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, and basically he tells him what, what the deal is. He gives him a little history lesson. He talks about the people of the city. Um, 
they weren't were, were they Catafran specifically or very very Catafran esque? I don't think they weren't. Uh, they, they weren't, weren't Catafrans. They were something else. Okay, gotcha. But I mean, if you know anything about Catafrans, I feel like there's a lot of comparisons that you could probably draw between the two, sure. um, creating magical, powerful magical items. This ancient civilization back there, um, uh, cavorting with the powers of chaos, et cetera, et cetera, creating this all powerful artifact, so on and so forth. Um, well. He, Go ahead. But all of this happens after Vermeer grabs the artifact, doesn't it? <clears throat> well, they they do meet the skink. Um, he's kind of called in. They, there's a salon sitting there, and then the skink priest is, you know, kind of comes in out of starlight. Dare you yeah. so nonchalantly call out a salon just sitting there? Like, oh, and by the <laughs> way, there's a kicking it. There's this survivor of the <laughs> old world just sitting there kicking it. Yeah, I suppose. Um, I'm sorry, Dave. I didn't mean to call you up. I apologize. No, that's fair. <laughs> You uh, literally said, I'm calling you out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so they, they kind of lay out what this is, but then uh, uh, while they're having this initial conversation, uh, that's when Vermeer comes blasting in. And uh, there's a sorceress duel. Does he get his hand on the shard? Yeah. Yeah, he eventually gets his hand on the shard here and then looks like he mortally wounds his slant, right? Like, yeah. Uh, and the slon's eye snaps open, and then they get taken back in time. That's where they get their big history lesson, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. It's, well, it's like a, it's a little aside. They get pulled into what turns out to be like the slon's memory, which is mm -hmm. uh, is the slon's memory of this place before, or something like that. So they're, they're so, yeah. Sorry, an important point before we get into the memory is that Shev manages to escape that's right. somewhat from Vermeer and grab the shade glass eye from him. And so Ecclesius is suddenly in the picture again. And Shev joins with Callus and Toll as they're watching this like terrible thing. And then the eye opens, and then they go into this, like basically what Zoantica was before the silver shard came into being. Um, so it is, it's this kind of, Everybody was like, oh, this is this great center of learning. This is all, you know, wonderful and a happy place. And the first place he takes them back to is like, oh, no, there was a Zinch cult here from basically the beginning. Right. Like this was the point of this place was just to bind others into service for Zinch. And the entire point of this civilization was to call this silver shard into being. Uh, which was uh, a really cool moment, and I also appreciated that the the leader of this Zinch cult was a woman, and the woman calls forth the silver shard, and then this is where our slan that we just saw shows up and is like, "Dude, no, this is not going to happen, right?" Like they have this interesting conversation about the the strands of fate and how Ecclesius is this important person. And Shev is this important person, and Callus and Toll, like, you know, significantly, Zentha is not in this conversation, but it's this, like, eons long, the Silver Shard has the power to unbind fate, right? Like, it's this realm splitting thing. So it's not, it, it's not one of the eight lamentations. But it easily could fit into one of the eight lamentations. I did have a passing thought where I tried to figure out if it was one of these, but I, I don't think it is. Um, it yeah. definitely fits that archetype, though. Uh, so they, the Slan manages to defeat the first Zinch threat, um, where at, at heavy losses, they have this amazing you know, Seraphon battle with full forces fighting back and forth and they manage to take out the leader and they get the silver shard but they cannot make it go away and they are forced to sit here for who knows how long simply to guard the silver shard from being taken again and uh, at that point the skink priest has a conversation with Ecclesius and Shev and Callus and Toll about we can make this go away, but Ecclesius has to give up his place within the shade glass so that Vermeer can be bound within it and Vermeer and the silver shard can be passed, can be cast into the place between realms. Mm. 
which was a really to me is a very interesting place because we have a place between the realms now it's called the gloaming and so that's where slanesh is that's where shade spire is right like that's where oh, underworld is yeah exactly. um so their job is to distract vermeer long enough for the slan to be able to call vermeer into the shade glass and ecclesias has to voluntarily come out um and so they have this uh epic confrontation uh where like basically vermeer is all powerful right like he's fighting against the slan and just beating him about the heads and face with this devastating magical onslaught and uh they managed to distract vermeer long enough for this ritual to happen and vermeer and the silver shard get cast into the space between realms and the good guys basically win right so end, end of book <laughs> end of book done and done um done and yeah done. no and it, it was a uh, i guess a tidy way to to wrap that up um and, and, and like an interesting and, and uh, i'll say unique i suppose but just uh, just a different way to sort of tackle these like cosmic powers and in what one would have to do like overcome them yeah basically <laughs> cool. um so i mean i i was convinced or i was uh sold on on this resolution to this this issue that they were were faced with mm -hmm. would you would you guys think of that that quote final solution uh i think i presented my argument which is that it basically cast him into the gloaming which to me is like i don't know if he's gonna go away for that long we'll see he might come back i take yeah. back my final solution by the way yeah. that, <laughs> Uh, yeah what what's your opinion on the final solution yeah. uh, uh, loaded question um yeah. yeah i i don't know if i necessarily read it exactly the same way as paul did that this was definitely going to the gloaming the spot in between those two particular yeah. realms definitely an assumption yeah 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 i mean i think there is a there is a void where the uh the seraphon have their big starships hanging out so it, it could have been there it could have been like there's there's other possibilities anyway uh i thought it was good i thought i felt fairly confident from the moment the slan showed up that the slan was going to be sacrificing itself in some way like it was already kind of withered had done so and i think it's something we've seen before uh, but yeah i i it, it wasn't it wasn't dissatisfying it wasn't uh didn't uh yeah didn't subvert any expectations in doing so but that's fine you don't have to do that every time so sure cool cool uh, uh, and I mean, I joke when I say that's the end of the book, but from here on out, they basically boogie the heck up out of there because in doing so, what do you expect is going to happen? That mountain's going to be facing cataclysmic uh, yeah. effects, and they need to they need to escape. And so they come running out of the tower. They come running across the excuse me the the battlefield. Um, there's no longer this magic force affecting like how they like can move through the area. So they're they're running. Um, it turns out that uh, all the Ko and and Arika's group have all escaped to the ship and the question is how are we going to get off this island how are we going off the, this island and lo and behold the ship comes around the corner and they're able to pick them up and they're able to jump off the ship or jump on the ship and and escape mm -hmm. in well, classic, uh go ahead paul hit me sorry one of the cool moments here was as they're running out they're like they see all the bodies of these zangor and everything else right but there's no seraphon right like it is this like cool final like nope the slan is dead these are gone right yeah. it is this wiping out of an entire force or battle or army whatever like based on one character dying because he was the only character that died yeah right and it was it was just a cool callback to you know nope these are all called forth from within the power of the slan nothing but um, stardust yeah like you and me um, now yeah and then they they get on the ko ship and they fly away and that should have been the end of the book should have been or what? they should have had the chapter after this chapter called the postlude or something or epilogue, epilogue i think is the word you're looking for yeah the yeah postlude, that's interesting though i like it right <laughs> um uh but yeah that that was the only like yeah writing thing that i was like well i don't know about yeah there was there's a postlude at the end of the book, 
kind of like is like oh look everybody survived and this is all great and like we're gonna resolve this un like implied un whatever situation uh between Are you Chev about, and Callus. You're talking about love, Paul? What do you have against love? I, I don't have anything against love. I just I didn't understand why it was like necessary towards the end of this book to kind of describe I don't know. All right, dear listener, in the epilogue, um, it turns out that over the course of this story, and I guess, like, I think they probably do allude to it a couple of times, but Shev... Oh, absolutely. Like, and, you could see it. Built yeah. I, I wasn't like, I don't know. It wasn't... Oh, yeah, moment. it wasn't like, oh, this is totally left inappropriate, but yeah. But Callus and Shev uh, are shacking up because they have been put through very traumatic times and they developed a bond stronger than, I don't know, friendship. Um yeah, but it <laughs> turns out I don't know. I, I've been, I've been out of the game so long, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so it, it sort of fast forwards a little bit and sh talks about their um, or gives gives uh, shows a scene um, between the two of them where this has sort of been going on for a while. But it turns out the siren song of adventure calls to Chev, and she's got to leave our boy Callus behind because. <sighs> Um, she's got to get out there and explore the world a little bit. So it was she, turns out it was just a promise to Ecclesius to oh, you know, to to see the world. He you know when he made his own kind of sacrifice, gave up his immortality in the uh, in the shade glass uh, in order to uh, stop Vermeer. Um, it, that was a cool moment for him, you know, right? Where mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and and so she's holding up a promise. Um, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't mean to trivialize her. Her. Oh, sure. no, no, just, um. But she's going to head out. Yeah. And so that the relationship sort of breaks up. Sad day. But, yeah. This, like, this was the most glaring to me, like, movie setting. Because <laughs> it's like, everything's fine. Everything's great. Wait, we're going to have that last scene at the end of the movie to make sure you know that there might be a sequel coming. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because they have this scene with Chev, and then they have the scene of Callus and Toby, and like, well, there's another battle. I mean, we've got to go I do this like, new thing. I feel like your main objection to this was that it said, you know, chapter whatever, 38, and it yeah. didn't say epilogue. That feels yeah. like semantics to me. Like, I, it, it didn't feel out of place, but That's you know, well, it didn't and, feel unexpected, at least. And furthermore, if this was truly like setting up a sequel thing, they would have just left it that they, they were in love or, and as a couple. But then the sequel would have opened up with, hey, whatever happened to that chef gal? And you'd be like, ah, it didn't work out. <laughs> Onwards. Yeah. To adventure. Um, so that didn't work out. Also, we didn't talk about the fact that Toll lost a hand. Oh, yeah. Oh, he lost an arm. arm. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah, um, an arm. Okay, you're right. Which was actually a cool moment for Vermeer. We didn't really talk much about the character development for him. Yeah. But he had this whole... Gnarly. Yeah, he had this whole, like, his body is mutating. Mm -hmm. And he had to wear the golden mask to be able to pass as human. Yeah, that's yeah. true. We didn't talk about um, that. And we, when he got the silver, the silver shard... He was able to pretend that he was human. He was able to project that he was human again. And, and wasn't he, that in some way like his whole goal? I mean, obviously the silver shirt is yep. powerful and you do all sorts of stuff, but that was almost the, like the motivating factor was just that he wanted to pretend to be human again. Yeah, and he intentionally cut off Toll's army. Toll's arm, arm excuse me. <laughs> hey, where um, did, hey, guys, real quick, where did Napoleon keep his armies? In his, in his sleeves. In his <laughs> uh, because he wanted Toll to know what it felt like to not yeah, your have body control was over all of yeah. yeah, exactly. So in the um, epilogue, uh, it turns out that like he obviously still doesn't have his hand back, and like apparently there's all sorts of ways to to regrow an arm, I guess. Um, and Toll's like, nah, I'll keep it off. Like it is, this serves as a reminder to like a lesson I needed to learn. Um, and so, I mean, maybe one day, but for right now, I'll, I'll go. I'll remain. <laughs> I wrote it down this way. I'll remain unarmed. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and he lost his right arm, right? And he, I assume he was right-handed, right? So that's if he's fighting with a, an axe in the left arm, he'd kind of like a bad axe, wouldn't he? Oh, that's general. Let me ask you a question. Uh, when can we? When can we stop this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no, we have so many questions left. Um, I think that's the gist of the epilogue. Was there anything else cool at the end of it? Uh, uh not that I know of. Cool. That was about it. Um. There was no museum. I was disappointed there was no museum. It belongs in a museum. Um, no, it turns... Again, I've never seen those movies. Well, um, there was a museum. That was where Zentha and the captain went to. to that was literally a museum. Looted up. All right, all right. Basically, and that's where the book ends. Let's talk about some questions that I always want to <laughs> ask. Hey, guys, who was your... 
we talked about this earlier. Who was your uh, who was your guy or gal? Who was your dude or dudette? Uh, Aaron, I feel like you know. I mean, I have an answer, but I don't want to leave it with that. I just asked the question, Davey, who was your person? <laughs> um, I, without taking the guy that I know you have picked, um, <laughs> I, uh, I would guess I'd say Callus. I, I kind of enjoyed. Um, he was not. He was. He was a fun uh pseudo lead like you know partially main lead um in that he wasn't he wasn't always you know uh signature heroic i guess uh like he'd he'd be seasick and he'd you know be like what the hell yeah like he he i guess he was kind of our stand-in a little bit you know uh, um and uh yeah like he uh in the in the in the sea battle, uh, he gets a rope whipped around like a, this sail is flapping around wildly and the rope whips around his ankle and yanks him right off the boat. And he, you know, he just gets lucky and lands on another boat or whatever, you know? So he's, uh, he gets through things, some things through skill, but some things just through luck. And, um, he's, uh, I don't know. So he, he was enjoyable just because he felt, uh, as, as characters go as people being characterized in this book goes i think he was one of the more believable ones yeah well, and relatable too i would yep. say yes maybe that's what i'm going for yeah. hey paul what do you think who's your who's your person uh i would pick chev i really liked her character um she probably had the most character development from the beginning of the book to the end uh in the beginning she kind of sets out on this like search for knowledge um and to fulfill her father's wishes and make some dicey allegiances in order to do so uh but then once she's like basically given the truth right by ecclesias of like this guy's terrible this is all bad you need to figure this out she becomes a much more interesting character where she's uh number one not helpless which is pretty awesome uh and number two also not amazing right she's not like she doesn't go to the opposite contrast and be like Zentha almost where it's like no I can kind of deal with anything and everything is fine and I'll just laugh in the face of danger and this is like she still manages to like her character manages to portray like fear without being like paralyzed by fear and useless um, and I thought there was a, a just a really cool arc of figuring out who she was and what her kind of purpose is um, and even though at the end of the book, she has the same kind of purpose going forward as she did at the beginning of the book, I feel like there was definitely a journey for her to understand what it is that she was doing instead of being like, I'm doing this because my father did this and I'm going to do this now to mm-hmm. no, this is my choice and this is what I want to do and I'm going to be amazing at it. Right. So I, I, I really appreciated that. Cool. Right on. Uh, my character was, uh, I think Davey knows that, or I'm Paul does too. Uh, Ecclesias is, was my guy. Um, just, I like his, his snark. I like his um, sort of omniscience, but not omniscience at the same time. Um, I liked his, uh, uh, like him him drawing from the knowledge of the age of myth. Like I, I said before, like I, I, I'm drawn to that. So like, I like talking to a character or like interacting with the character um, from that era. Um, and I like that, like this pompous, um, very like fairly full of himself character at the end of the day, still was willing to like sacrifice him at the end for the greater sacrifice himself at the end for the greater good. Uh, I think really tied a bow like on that. This character. is not forty k. We're not talking about Talia. Oh sure, fair enough. Um, so uh, I like. I think it was a, a, a sort of a breath of fresh air, um, a different perspective from like a lot of the characters that we we've seen. Um, he was. I mean, not that he's a trope, but I mean, he's kind of a trope a little bit, but like presented in a new way because he's just this disembodied like sentience, which I thought was a fun way, fun, fun take on that, like pompous scholarly like character. Um, well, yeah. and, and yeah. even in like crazy situations where they're circling around like the um, water spout, and he's like, whoa, like crazy. Like, what if I fall? Will I sink to the bottom? Matt, like I'll see stuff that nobody's seen. What could yeah, possibly be that exactly. deep? And you're like, yeah, but how the hell are you ever getting up from there? But I, I like that, you know, uh, he had he had a sort of consistent through line in his thinking. It was pretty fun to to think. Yeah. I mean, usually a lot of times somebody who's been stuck, you know, with these fantasy novels or write somebody who's been stuck in a prison like that, like, 
yeah, they just went crazy after 200 years of just sitting on their own. And <laughs> this guy was, this guy was still interesting. And I don't know. Agreed, agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I, uh, I, I really enjoyed his character a lot too. Um, it was fun to have a helpless, useless flailing character that didn't need to be defended. Right. Like that didn't like, that wasn't the plot point that was like, Oh, we got to, we got to defend him, so now we're stuck in this other stupid situation. Or we've got to go back for him because he's stupid to be able to figure out what's going on to begin with. Which I think his character was very much written to be that kind of a character. But by putting him in the shade glass eye, it allowed him to be a part of the story and really drive the story forward without falling into the trope of like, oh, there's this idiot that we have to, you yeah. know, this useless member of the party. Exactly. Um do you guys think you learned anything about the mortal realms that you didn't know before? Um, I don't really think so. Um, I think I mentioned that early on is that it didn't feel like it was a big revelation. Um, I may be overlooking something though. Paul. Um, I think what I have learned is that like the cataphranes were the first like ancient civilization that we kind of knew. Right based on Shadespire, they they had a background. It wasn't all that explained, but it was there. Um, of this ancient, intelligent, like successful civilization, right? Um, and I thought it was really cool that we kind of had that encountered to the for, for the first time. And then we also had um, in Flame the campaign supplement. Um, I know what you're talking about. Firestorm. Firestorm, thank you. In Firestorm, we had this other like ancient civilization, different, uh, but ancient, learned, decrepit, you know. And now in um, in Silver Shard, we have this other completely different, ancient, decrepit, and learned civilization. But one of the things that we learned is that through Ecclesius, he was able to talk to the Cataphranes in this other decrepit civilization. Like, the golden age that we're going through now is not the golden age of the mortal realms because that golden age had already existed. Mm. We have trade, we have culture passing back and forth, right? We have a rich person from this place and their name is Ecclesius, the realms Walker, right? That implies that there's a far more availability of travel, far more availability of exploration and that even in this travel, at the when he realized that he was coming to the end, he's like, I'm gonna go buy this shade spire, this shade glass necklace to preserve myself. Right? Like this like I, I know I'm repeating myself, but like this is not the golden age of Age of Sigmar. The golden age of Age of Sigmar is far in the past, but we can still taste some of that and see some of that, even with uh going through passing the age of chaos etc there's still glimmerings and still tastes of that coming forward and that to me is a really cool thing instead of having these isolated civilizations that never talk to each other and develop completely asymmetrically it's more of a combined realm of all the eight realms that a combined um feeling and i got that feeling the for the first time when i read the beast man battle tome the uh, because it talks about how there is more of this like all all overarching realm feeling and chaos has that as well where they have these different gods but they all have the same understanding even before the chaos gods reveal themselves in the realms there's this general understanding this general knowledge and um, so i think that that feeling to me was far more presented accurately in this book and i haven't seen that nearly as much in other books because they tend not to go back as far and they tend to talk be more stormcast focused right which is not going to go nearly as back far into the background so i thought that was a really cool kind of explanation of, of what's going on cool yeah no that's a good point um in terms of things i learned i don't know that i learned anything in fact the opposite maybe i didn't learn i still don't know <laughs> if they're on our stardust or if they're flesh and blood at this point um i thought things had changed but apparently they haven't yeah i was wondering i think they must be both uh and i think also 
because the the not retcon but the uh, revelation that they could exist as flesh and blood that came during malign importance big deal everybody got excited about that mm. distinctly possible that nick horth was writing this while somebody else was making yeah. that decision so well actually um nick horth wrote that story well then i say nick horth get your get your act together well, I wrap it up all right um well, so we do yeah. want to talk about like what shape the characters are at the end i feel like we already referenced it um uh chev sort of loved and left Kala, so like he's he's suffered that quote-unquote loss um and toll doesn't have an arm anymore so uh it'll be interesting to see how they react if there is a second era additional book which i reckon there probably will be so i'll be excited <laughs> to fix it i mean it up. finishes with them saying like He's like, we got places to go, yeah. places far away from here, all the way to the Jade Kingdoms and beyond. And like, yeah. Okay, the yeah. classic sequel like lead in. Um, I do want to take real quick some time. Like we did reach out and see if anybody had any questions they want us to talk about. So I want to touch on them real quick before we wrap up. Um, uh, question from uh, so I don't. You guys know Boston, Boston, right? Yeah, Neo Boston. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think you probably know him better than I do. But he asked, uh, "Was the romance a first in the in an AOS novel? Um, and did the romance side plot make the character seem a bit more human?" Um, I think so. Though I don't know that it was necessarily the first because there was that short story the other a couple months ago about the lightning golem where there was like a storm mm -hmm. castle of interest. But it was one of the first, I would say. Um, which, not that I need it per se, but I'm not against love stories in my in my story. So I say bring it on um and i think it probably did make him feel a bit, you, bit more human callous especially because like like he's like the archetypal archetypical human in these situations where like you're supposed to in some way like insert yourself into that like character um and in doing so i think it grounds him a little bit um, what did um you are order of azir's witch hunters supposed to be alone quite possibly in which case that would make sense why he is um yeah, I'm just wondering if like that that was meant to be seen as something where he's breaking his intention to fully commit to the Order of Azir. Oh, I didn't get that impression, but maybe. I don't know. It was weird. Davey, what did you think? Just a random thought. The romance. Uh, I thought it was fine. I thought it was um, serviceably written. I mean, I, I felt a little telegraphed that I was like, ah, I think this might be going to happen. Yep, it mm -hmm. happened. Um, but uh, I don't think it detracted from anything. If it, it might have added a little bit, uh, I I like I don't know. I like that it's possible, and I I yeah. I don't think it was done. It sounds like I'm down on it. I don't I don't think it was done poorly by any stretch of the imagination. I thought it was fine, um, and I, I I agree. I think it made them feel more like people rather than conduits for battle scenes. Sure. Yeah, well, and I've seen it done worse, so that's not the end. Of it. Um, in the in the same breath, he asked, um, "Is this the first nautical adventure? Did the seafaring battles heighten the overall adventure tale?" Um, I think we talked about earlier, like it wasn't a sea battle per se, but they were on a ship in Play Garden, like right, like that was much much of the fight was on a a ship, wasn't it? Because they stole it from what's his face, the Nurgle pirate guy. Um, but I think it it, it did heighten the overall adventure tale like it, it, it lended itself to an adventure on the high seas um story what do you guys think about the the nautical aspect of it um i don't know if i it was it, like it didn't detract for me um it would have been cool to do it in kind of a different setting maybe or just a different way uh the, the sea was the most unfantastical part of the book, which I don't know. It could be seen as something that really helps to ground it in a very high fantastical it, setting. No, it wouldn't ground it at all. It's on the sea. <laughs> You're right. It wouldn't ground it at all. Uh, to to really make it more relatable, I don't know. Um, it was cool, and I enjoyed it. I don't know if I would have enjoyed it more if it was a little bit more fantastical. Right on. David, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was fun. Um, I thought it was a different look. I, I mean, I guess while I said I didn't feel like I had big revelations about it, it, it gave a just another little angle on uh, on the mortal realms. Here's what it's like to be on the on the open seas. Yeah, new perspective. Yeah. Um, especially when you live in a world where like there's a, like airplane, well, not airplanes, but airships and stuff. To think that like the sea is still a vi viable way to ship stuff. I mean, hell, it is in the real life too, I guess. So right, I should exactly. be so dismissive of it. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, 
Uh, Nygaard asked us um, how many, he said like blank. I think he probably means slan. Um, how many did slan are we up to now? Uh, they're supposed to be rare, rightfully so. Um, and what's the ratio of survive <clears throat> dies in their appearances? Um, I haven't read quite as much as some folks are. Like there's that Lord of the Cosmic Gate. There's a slan in there and, and he kicks butt and he lives. Yeah. Um, is there one in the Realm Gate Wars that I didn't read? And then also, I think we talked yeah. about ones maybe. I, uh, I wish I could have uh, researched this question and answered it uh, a little bit better, but I did. I, I mean, the reason I had the same instinct that the, the question asker does here where uh, as I, you know, when I'm like, Oh, there's a slant. He's probably going to die, which <laughs> tells me that I must've read this happening multiple times before. So mm. um, it's supposed so, to be rare. Yeah. I've got an interesting point. Right. We'll, I think, we'll be, we'll be I think, judge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can judge. This is better. All right, so Slan in the old world were rare, right? But there were a ton for being That's rare because there was fourth generation, second generation, third generation, first generation. There was even fifth generation because in fifth and sixth edition, you could buy up to the generation that you wanted to. So the fourth generation got one power, third generation, second, second generation, first generation, four, right? The more powerful it was, the more points you paid, the more you could field. So there were four generations of these things that were in the old world, at least. And granted that a bunch of the first generation ones were not active in Warhammer Fantasy. Um, but especially if we're going to go super current, right? Like they escaped the old world aboard these starships, right? Now they're releasing Blackstone Fortress. Blackstone Fortress for 40k were built by the old ones. I don't like where this is going. The Slan are the children of the old ones, or perhaps the old ones themselves. The Slan, more than any other race in fantasy, are not a race that needs to be confined to just the old world. If the old ones are in 40k and the old ones are in fantasy the Slan could easily be far more than just what we have seen in Warhammer Fantasy. And to assume that because they were rare in Warhammer Fantasy, that they should be rare in the Mortal Realms is not necessarily a given. Yeah, I mean, I think they might be described as rare in their own battle tome. Okay. Right. Yeah, so that's 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 true. Though an interesting connection that uh, I would like to see explored at one point. Um, there's a last question that I didn't realize that I didn't add to the list. I didn't see come through, but um, from a Dr. Hank, uh, he wants to talk about bone splitters. He loves that faction, but there's so little lore on them. Davey, I'm going to ask you from the bone splitter perspective, what did, what did you think from our little blurb that we saw in the, in the book? Uh, I mean, unfortunately they were, uh, they were almost interchangeable. Like it was like a, a skin on, I mean, they could have been beastmen. They could have been, they, there wasn't a, a lot that made them particularly bone splitters. So if he's looking Looking for bone splitter action. This isn't probably the one that that I was. Maybe I was having this conversation with you. I was thinking, I would love to have a full length novel from a from a green skin perspective. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, Oryx, but even even Grotz would be pretty fun too. Um, but uh, I don't. I guess uh, I think I had that uh, thought as I was reading. You know, they had Orktober or Orktober with uh, mm -hmm. all that. Reading some of that, and then uh, um, with. Uh, night vault reading the uh even just looking at the text on zarbags gets like the, sure. their objective cards i'm like yeah yeah this is fun this is really this is enjoyable you know like uh i i sure would like to read a whole lot more of this than just these two mm. sentences on a card you know so um yeah. i'd be down yeah in the old world they had the scar snake novel which was i i really thoroughly enjoyed in which they would do something like that in fan in uh age of sigmar and then I know in the the Beast series for 40K, they explored a little bit more of orc culture and they have intelligent orcs and more of a 40K setting. But I definitely feel like in Warhammer Fantasy, they tended to focus far more on the human viewpoint. And in Age of Sigmar, they're starting to break out of that more and presenting viewpoints that aren't necessarily just humans. And I, I think that that, specifically Greenskins, would be a real fun, engaging way of really breaking out of that mold and going forward. Like we've had some other bits of it. I think was it Firestorm that had the hero orc 
that was like building up or was, was it another supplement? I don't remember. I'm not they're, sure. Yeah. They're, they've written a little bit more that is not exclusively from a human viewpoint. Um, but yeah, I, I think we would all love to see more greens. Well, I would love to see moon clan or, you know, spider clan if possible, spider fang background. Cause that would be amazing. But you know, one day, I think with the volume of the books coming out and the novels coming out, I think it's a foreground conclusion that we're going to see a lot, a wide range of different perspectives. Yeah. I, mean, I shouldn't assume, but I hope we're going to see a wide range of perspectives. So that was the list of the questions that we had. Um, is there anything else you guys want to talk about before we give our final reviews? That was your chance. It's too late. Uh, <laughs> nice. Uh, so is there anything else you want to add to your initial review that you kicked out earlier in the episode? I mean, uh, I think it all pretty much holds. If you if if you're uh, if you're looking for an adventure, um, if you liked Callus and Toll when you saw him the first time around, go for it. Um, if I was giving somebody a book to start with, uh, this might not. I mean, obviously being the second in in a set of two, although I don't think there's much reason you'd really have to read City of Secrets to you know get this. It's not like there was uh, big connections. I occasionally, and this is this may have just been specific to uh, the mood I was in when I was reading the book. I occasionally felt like I could play uh, Black Library Bingo a little bit. <laughs> where I was like, somebody is going to snap, growl, or shout the word "enough," and it happened like multiple times. You know, <laughs> enough. And like, oh god, all right. Um, somebody's going to be turned into a bloody ruin. Somebody's going to be punched off their feet. Somehow, character's going to know. Oh, I've broken at least two ribs. Like, man, <laughs> I don't think that's how it works, uh, based on my knowledge of it. But, uh, those, those, I, I think I started racking up a few of those sort of more petty things about it. Um, but that's, that's not really unique to this book. Uh, and I think it was just that I didn't have enough, you know, moments of like amazing to like, you know, kind of see past some of those. Like, I, I am sometimes able to. Uh, that being said, I think I've been thoroughly spoiled by Josh Reynolds, uh, knocking him out of the park relentlessly for us um stop yeah uh but yeah enjoyable um again i don't want uh criticism of it to be portrayed as like a, a negative overall take on it enjoyed it i'm not not disappointed i read it so what would you say i would say six out of eight spider legs <laughs> i uh i definitely enjoyed it um i enjoyed particularly the presentation of the salon and the seraphon battle um, especially now that you mention it, Davey, like the bone splitters definitely seem tacked on or like almost a pastiche of like, look, it's a general threat that is going to menace people. Um, I, I wish he would have put a little bit more description in it, like he did at the Seraphon, like exactly how they were fighting or something. Like it would have been very appropriate in the realm of Gur to have a wandering beast or several wandering beasts that were coming through and then have the have the uh, bone splitters come in following it. And that's how they all ended up in battle together. We've, we've had a couple times now, I think where you're just wandering into a place and like, Oh, there's bone splitters here. I guess we're going to fight, uh, which is not to me all that engaging. Um, but I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and I did enjoy reading it, but as I said, I, I didn't feel that impetus to read from one to the beginning, but that's probably more about the writing style than it is about the typical way that I read a book. So right on. I'd, I'd recommend it. I thought it was good. Sure. Um, I don't have much to add beyond what you two just said and what I said earlier. It's a fun adventure book, very similar to like a blockbuster like movie. And so like if you're going, if you expect that going into it, I think you'll probably be pleased. Um, mm -hmm. And there's not much else to, to add, though I look forward to the next one. Like I'll, I'll read the next one and I'm I, I, interested to see where they go from here. Um, I hope, mm -hmm. I hope they, they continue the continue the series. So I think that's about it. Um, I think it might be time for our reforging. Wow. Follow us on Twitter at The Moral Realms. Uh, and you can follow us individually. Hey, Davey, where can they find you? At red underscore Zeke. Right. How about Paul? Uh, at PJ Shard. Are you going to change it to P at PJ Silver Shard? Mm, I don't think I have enough letters for it. But maybe. We'll see. I encourage it. And then you can find me at, uh, at Dos Asos. Um, and you can find all our Mortal Realms content at www.themortalrealms.com. That's about it.
Catch you guys later. See you. Have a good one.